Buongiorno, good morning, bonjour. Uh, uh, welcome back to those of you who uh, um, were here yesterday and uh, hello to uh, those of you who are here for the first time and who are connecting from uh, pretty much everywhere in the world. Honorable Minister, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are hopeful that today we can achieve the same level of uh, extraordinary level of the debate that we were able to achieve yesterday. Um, it's not going to be easy, but we're going to try our best. Um, I would like to um, start by apologizing ex ante for possible excessive noise coming from the street today. Believe it or not, this is the second time we have to endure a session of the uh, recording of Mission Impossible 7 with Tom Cruise, who's outside. Uh, driving the car in Via Palisperna and Via Milano. Um, so it's, it becomes quite noisy. It's very uh, exotic, but it's quite noisy. So apologies for that. There's not much we can do. Um, we just hope that the car will not crash into this uh, piece of cultural heritage. That's, uh... <laughs> right. So it's also of the essence that we stick to time um, because we have a very complete full agenda today. We are going to uh, start day two, session four three of the conference um, talking about uh, challenges and, and future steps. Um, the different panelists today are going to be talking about practical things and about um, how the uh, convention is being treated and implemented in certain jurisdictions. So it's going to be a, perhaps a bit less theoretical and more practical, which is also a very important part for us. And uh, we are going to be uh, beginning um, with the presentation on the Convention on Access to Justice. Uh, the uh, presenter is uh, Professor um, Agustin Lazar, um, who's a professor at the University of 1st of December 1918, and a former Prosecutor General of Romania. Uh, la présentation se fera en français. Uh, Monsieur le Professeur, uh, vous avez la parole. Monsieur le Secrétaire General Ignacio Tirado, Mesdames et Messieurs, Je tiens à remercier les organisateurs d'UNIDROIT pour l'invitation à prendre la parole lors de cette conférence jubilière. Après une très bonne journée de débat théorique, je vous invite à Alba Iulia pour une application pratique pour étudier ensemble un site archéologique de l'UNESCO bénéficiaire de la protection de la Convention d'UNIDROIT. Alba Iulia est surnommée l'autre capitale, la capitale culturelle historique de la Roumanie, la ville fondée au IIe siècle après Jésus-Christ par l'empereur Trajan, devint, après la conquête de la Dacie, la capitale de la province romaine de Dacie, maintenant une ville-musée en air libre. Très proche d'Alba Iulia se trouve le site de l'UNESCO Sarmizeghetus Aregia, l'ancien capital du royaume de Dacia. Il y a 20 ans, le site faisait l'objet, malheureusement, l'objet de fouilles non autorisées, une calamité déjà évoquée hier par le professeur Fromageau. Selon l'historien Dio Cassius, la capture du trésor royal de Sarmizegetusa était une des principales raisons du conflit militaire casus belli entre les Romains et les Dace il y a 2000 ans. Le résultat principal du conflit a été l'occupation des Dacia et la naissance du peuple romain comme une branche orientale de la latinité. Voilà des biens culturels emblématiques et identitaires pour nous, les Roumains. Faire remarque de cercle au fil du temps. Après 2000 ans, la récupération d'importants parties du trésor royal de Sarmizegetusa, résultant de fouilles non autorisées, objets volés et recyclés sur le marché des Antiquités, est redevenue la raison de nouveaux conflits, cette fois un conflit juridique entre les autorités roumaines et les réseaux internationaux de trafiquants. À la fin des années 90, Dans un contexte complexe du sud-est de l'Europe, les chasseurs de trésors ont ouvert par effraction, par effraction 
la capsule de l'histoire scellée il y a 2000 ans, causant des dommages considérables au patrimoine culturel. Les trésors de bracelets, des milliers de pièces de monnaie d'or, des bijoux, etc., au total des dizaines de kilogrammes d'or volés et recyclés, ont marqué les traces de l'itinéraire criminel, visibles comme les traces sales de, de Grèce et aussi les anciens réseaux d'intermédiaires vers les maisons de vente. L'un des principaux résultats de l'action de récupération menée par les autorités roumaines est la mise à la preuve de l'efficacité pratique des instruments juridiques internationaux, parmi lesquels la Convention du droit occupe une place centrale. En tant qu'ancien magistrat du ministère public roumain, impliqué dans la coordination de ces enquêtes, j'ai vécu l'importance de la coopération internationale, de l'échange de bonnes pratiques dans le domaine de la protection du patrimoine culturel afin de mettre en œuvre les instruments juridiques internationaux les plus efficaces. Alors, la Convention du droit a pour but de lutter contre le trafic illicite de biens culturels en modifiant le comportement de l'acheteur. Ça, c'est très important, en obligeant à vérifier la provenance licite de son achat, d'établir un corps minimum de règles juridiques communes aux fins de restitution et de retour des biens culturels entre les États dans le but de la préservation et la protection du patrimoine culturel. L'effet direct de l'instrument, une autre chose importante, c'est l'accès à la justice. Il peut être invoqué directement par des particuliers, ça c'est important. La création d'obligations directement envers les personnes dans les États qui l'ont ratifié. Je veux vous présenter quelque chose qui est très bien connu, le mécanisme de droit civil, pour nous rappeler le mécanisme de droit civil permettant l'accès à la justice, la demande de restitution de biens culturels volés ou de retour de ceux qui ont été exportés illicitement. La Convention stipule euh, dans un article très important « Si un bien culturel a été volé, il doit être restitué » une disposition d'une clarité euh, remarquable déjà soulignée par M. le professeur Renaud hier. Le possesseur d'un bien culturel volé qui doit le restituer ne pourra prétendre à une indemnité équitable que s'il peut prouver avoir fait preuve de la diligence requise au moment de l'achat et qu'il ne pouvait pas savoir ou n'aurait pas pu savoir que le bien était volé. Puis, le cas de biens culturels sortis de leur pays. La charge de la preuve incombe au possesseur qui doit démontrer qu'il ne savait ou n'aurait pas dû raisonnablement savoir au moment de l'acquisition que le bien avait été exporté illicitement. La personne dépossédée peut introduire une demande de restitution des biens culturels volés ou de retour de ceux qui ont été exportés illicitement. Le délai de trois ans a compté du moment des choses, des détails qui sont très bien connus. Je veux souligner un peu le mécanisme civil de médiation mis en œuvre par la Roumanie, par des besoins pratiques, accorde à l'amiable restitution des biens, indemnisation équitable, réserve du droit de demander le remboursement. La Convention du droit, c'était un instrument juridique clé pour le recouvrement des biens volés. Le ministère de la Culture a reçu de mise en œuvre le mécanisme de médiation rapide et peu coûteuse. Première étape, préservation provisoire des artefacts au bureau d'un expert neutre pour, pour être examiné par des experts. Deuxième, 
Les commerçants ont soumis par l'avocat une déclaration notariale avec des réponses à un questionnaire détaillé de clarification. Troisième, des documents joints pour prouver les montants d'argent payés pour l'achat, les mesures prises par le titulaire pour vérifier l'origine légale, les circonstances de l'acquisition, s'il savait ou aurait raisonnablement de raisonnablement savoir que les biens culturels avaient été volés et exportés illégalement. Clarifier les aspects de la bonne foi et la volonté des possesseurs de retourner les artefacts volés, la solution alternative de résolution des litiges était préférable à une action en justice, souvent coûteuse, bien sûr. Le ministère de la Culture a conclu des accords à l'amiable en payant aux possesseurs de bonne foi diligents au moment de la restitution l'indemnisation équitable prévue à l'article 4, le coût résultant des documents et les frais de restitution de transport d'artefacts d'avocats ou de notaires. En versant au titulaire l'indemnité légale, le ministère de la Culture s'est réservé le droit de demander son remboursement par les personnes responsables du vol de l'exportation illégale et du recyclage des objets. Recevant une juste compensation euh, collectionnaire et commerçant des États-Unis, Allemagne, de Suisse, du Royaume-Uni et du Bulgarie ont appliqué la la règle de restitution du bien volé. Ça, c'est très important des collectionneurs euh, originaires des pays qui n'ont pas signé ou ratifié euh, la euh, euh, convention. Ils, euh, ils ont considéré d'être d'accord avec euh, cette règle euh, à, en considération euh, de l'importance identitaire des biens euh, culturels. Euh, 11 des 13 bracelets qui en total ont euh, 12 kg et demi environ, réintégrés dans le patrimoine culturel national, ont été récupérés de cette manière. Deux boucliers d'as, l'autre des pièces monétaires d'or, etc. La haute cour de cassation de Roumanie et les tribunaux roumains ont rendu des décisions en constatant restitution volontaire de certaines pièces effectuées par les possesseurs en vertu de l'article de l'article 3, paragraphe 1, convention unie droit, ordonné aux auteurs de l'infraction de vol la restitution en nature, ça c'est très important, à l'État roumain, les objets volés ou de payer en solidaire leur valeur, le remboursement de l'indemnité versée aux possesseurs de bonne foi et les dépenses engagées par l'examen de la restitution de biens. Voilà, en février 2002, une enquête journalistique a vérifié les informations sur le vol d'un trésor royal d'As du, du site l'UNESCO Sarmizeguetuzare qui a découvert une spirale d'or massive volée à un kilogramme et demi. Citation, « Ce que vous voyez ici dans ma main est un bracelet en or massif caché par l'un des chasseurs de trésors. » Un bracelet qui, je vous le garantis, n'importe quel musée dans le monde voudrait est d'environ euh, 1500 grammes. C'est incroyable. Après quelques vérifications préalables, euh, le magistrat euh, a estimé qu'il qu était impossible de prouver l'existence du bracelet volé. Excusez-moi, messieurs les professeurs, vous avez seulement cinq minutes. Ah, D'accord, merci. Des circonstances factuelles n'est pas permis de récupérer les choses et les autorités ont fait face à la loi du silence. Personne n'a rien vu ou entendu. Plus tard, le procureur, notre procureur, a décidé d'engager des poursuites en corrélation avec le mécanisme unidroit.
Voilà, l'objet du vol bien culturel emblématique représenté sur la colonne de Trajan, vous pouvez voir le texte qui est ici. L'étude de cas euh, implique l'article 3, 4 de l'Unidroit, les personnes qui ont été condamnées à des peines considérables et euh, obligées pour... Euh, dédommager l'État roumain. La Convention unidroit et la coopération judiciaire des décisions de gel de biens ou d'éléments de preuve ont joué un rôle clé pour le recouvrement des biens volés. Une affaire disjointe qui est similaire et implique de cette manière la règle de la restitution des biens volés, article 3, en payant aux possesseurs de bonne foi diligent au moment de restitution, l'indemnisation équitable, le coût, etc., en versant au titulaire l'indemnité légale de la... Le ministère de la Culture s'est réservé le droit de demander son remboursement. Euh, un très intéressant système de recyclage. Euh, le matériel est à votre disposition et on peut voir les pièces qui ont été envoyées de Munich à Chicago et retour pour recycler les, les artefacts. Le grand défi de la protection du patrimoine culturel, le blanchiment des biens culturels, j'ai exposé ici le mécanisme avec modus operandi, euh, toute la description du mécanisme de droit pénal en cas de recyclage. Un euh, cas de récupération de pièces euh, à Paris, la Biennale euh, d'Antiquaire, la coopération c'est très important, euh, l'action focus, focus sur l'authenticité des artefacts euh, volés, mutualisation de l'expertise judiciaire, les pièces euh, récupérées, et euh, la lutte contre le trafic de biens culturels, le mécanisme judiciaire pénal, la coopération judiciaire internationale qui a beaucoup de difficultés, malheureusement. Euh, C'est important d'avoir une spécialisation dans le domaine, de coopérer avec Eurojust, avec le parquet. Et une proposition. Le parquet européen peut représenter l'avenir des enquêtes complexes transfrontalières le système judiciaire en Roumanie. Vous pouvez le voir ici. Trésor encore recherché au niveau international. Les pièces lex municipalis trois mention qui ont surpris la communauté scientifique après la récupération. C'est le professeur Eck qui a fait des commentaires très intéressants de l'Université de Cologne. Le contenu les critères d'intégrité, de compétence et de dignité des candidats à une fonction publique très actuelle euh, il y a 2000 ans et euh, dans ce jour. Quelles seraient les leçons tirées du passé Un nihiliste pourrait dire euh, « celui qui volait, volera à nouveau euh, ». Les recycleurs, les recycleront et ceux qui ont beaucoup d'argent investissent dans les artefacts de valeur. C'est bien à contraire, dit le positiviste. Et important de savoir pour prévoir afin de pouvoir. Il y a 18e siècle était formulé l'adage présenté ici. Alors, c'est une leçon de culture juridique qui nous présente. Euh, l'efficacité et euh, l'équitabilité des, des euh, règles du droit, les nouvelles évolutions. Je veux souligner le caractère très rigoureux euh, qui est similaire à une équation mathématiques. Ces règles ont sensibilisé les possesseurs de bonne foi qui ont accepté la médiation et la restitution volontaire. Je voudrais souligner, enfin, remercier en finale aux experts. C'était une activité très euh, laborieuse d'une grande équipe euh, et les experts qui sont présentés ici, Barbara Depper, Lucia Marinescu, Johan Piso, Werner Eck, Ernesto Berlander, des 
euh, centaines de policiers, magistrats, experts et diplomates de Roumanie, de 15 euh, autres États qui ont travaillé pour récupérer les euh, pièces. Et, euh, en final, je voudrais remercier aussi aux documentaristes, producteurs, euh, des documentaires qui ont sensibilisé le public. Par exemple, Dan Dimanchescu et Emilia Nicolaescu, et je euh, vous prie l'assistance technique si pourra euh, déclencher le petit vidéo qui euh, va finaliser, illustrer en finale ma présentation, si sera possible pour l'assistance technique. In 2011, the Romanian government makes an astonishing revelation to the world. Thirteen ancient spirals made of solid gold are put on display at Romania's National History Museum. Nothing like this had ever been found before. They have a very strong uh, elemental force to them. For over a decade, an entire nation has been mesmerized by the country's biggest archaeological mystery of the last hundred years. Some attribute the golden spirals to the Dacian king Dechebar, who ruled over Transylvania more than 2,000 years ago. Where were these golden spirals discovered? And how did they find their way into the antique shops of London, Paris, and New York? He said to me that he feels sorry that these peace objects don't remain in Romania, but he said one has to make a living. Are they pieces of jewelry or ritual objects under the spell of an ancient curse? Or could the golden spirals of Transylvania be sophisticated fakes? Sincer mai simplu de de falsificat. Does ancient history have to be rewritten? Or has the world been deceived by one of the biggest art hoaxes of the new millennium? Merci beaucoup, le professeur. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next presentation. Um, our next speaker, it, it's a tradition to say of someone who that doesn't deserve or may, need an, an introduction. Bon, Excuse me. Uh, but this is uh, more clear than ever that uh, the next speaker doesn't need an introduction <laughs> in this uh, um, venue. Uh, she wears two hats here today, the one of uh, president of UNIDRA and that of uh, Professor of Università del Sacro Cuore de Milano. Eh, Professor Maiakira Malaguti uh, is going to talk to us about uh, the Convention on Immunity for Seizure. Professor Malaguti, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ignazio, and uh, thank you, Valentina, for, for the screen. I, I, I do wear two hats, but I must say that I was invited to come to the conference before I was appointed president. So it's, uh, I, I would have get this invitation anyhow. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not because I'm president that I'm speaking. I tried to catch up with the small delay that, that we already have. Uh, as you can see from the screen, uh, I tried to address the issue of the relationship between the various domestic laws on immunity for, uh, from seizure that you have and uh, the UNIDRA convention. What is, I mean, the issue is temporary transfer of goods, no, of, of cultural goods normally for uh, exhibits. Temporary, temporary uh, transfer is not covered by the convention, if not for the uh, specific issue that when the transfer, is, when the good is not uh, restituted, in that case, uh, it is considered to be illicitly exported. If uh, after the expiration of the time for exhibit, the, the, the good is not, is not given back. Uh, so this is the only, the only reference that you have on temporary 
export, let's say, of the of uh, of the good. But there might be uh, there might be effects uh, on the procedure for the convention and the use and the application of the convention. So the uh, this kind of laws can still interfere with the scope and the working of the of the UNIDRA convention. There are quite a number of domestic laws now on uh, on this field. It's uh, many of these concerned countries that did not uh, sign the convention, but you do have still some that signed the, signed the convention, or at least some countries that have draft bills on, uh, on the issue. As you can see from, uh, from, my, from my slides, we can, in an extremely broad approximation, uh, see four approaches normally. Uh, in this presentation, I focus only on the first two. Uh, I leave the second two, we refer, which refer to the direct immunity based on the immunity of states, either by a convention or by, uh, by a customary law. I leave it I leave it aside because it is um too complex. It has an issue also on uh, jurisdictional immunities, which is something that we might address, uh, uh, which I'll open a number of issues that is better. We, we have no time to address to address now. So leaving aside this letter C and D in my, in my slide, uh, which it, uh, in any event, can be addressed for those who are interested in a paper that, in a report that in uh, 2013 was issued by CADI. CADI, for those who are not familiar with the international law, is a committee of legal advisors on public international law. Uh, normally, they are the uh, coming, coming from states. They issued, they issued a report on immunity of state owned, owned cultural property on loan. And over there, you do find all the discussion on the immunity from uh, immunity, jurisdictional immunities and in general, the issue of specific issue concerning immunity of states. A and B are instead different because these are, you can, you can find these two different approaches, either to send a comfort letter by a state to permit the immunity of a good, or to have a sort of automatic uh, immunity of uh, goods of a cultural, cultural value. You find for the first time this, this kind of issues quite structurally discussed in uh, recommendations that came out uh, from the group of experts on mobility of collections uh, in uh, 2010 in a subgroup of this committee that was working specifically on immunity from seizure. This is a working group working for, uh, for, for the European Commission. So they, they uh, edited a report uh, committed by the Commission. So the kind of analysis refers to the region of, of Europe, but it's still extremely interesting for the results and for the conclusion that they reach. So I think they have a, a somehow relevance also for countries outside, outside the European Union. As you can see again from this, from the slide, you see that uh, while other subgroups were able to reach conclusions by 2005, which was the expected time for the report, this subgroup was not able to reach a conclusion until 2010. This is already a signal. This also tells us that uh, it was extremely difficult to find a solution. And they indeed discovered that uh, they were unable to find a straightforward position on the issue because there are conflicting interests on that. You see that on the one side, they consider that the immunity might have, might be, might have some uh, worth in the fact that they can help hidden goods to re-emerge. So there was a way to try to uh, stimulate the transparency and the re-emergence of goods on the, in uh, true exhibits uh, expositions. 
On the other side, of course, in this way, you would limit the rights of the person that uh, is, the old, is the owner or the possessor of the good and would have a right to get the, the, good, the good back. And they concluded that there was no optimal solution on this matter. So we do start from the admission that is not an issue. I think that what we heard yesterday on the different stakeholders and the different interests on the property rights uh, on goods show that it is indeed a difficult issue because you do have a number of different interests and a number of stakeholders involved also in this specific uh, activity of showing uh, arty crafts or cultural goods around, around the world. The final recommendation, as uh, uh, Valentina put on the screen, where, as I told you, uh, concerning the European Commission, because it was a study for the European Commission, not to develop any model law, but so the uh, legis legislation, so the, the recommendation was not to try to find common grounds on, uh, on this issue, but to use prudence in the uh, to member states in the way they should uh, they should uh, um, regulate the issue of uh, of immunity and to try to minimize any kind of possible uh, risk of conflict but and i think it's interesting what you see in letter c at the same time they advised they invited states to put in place procedures for controlling the acquisition of cultural assets and to contemplate mechanisms for tracing assets it is interesting because somehow they say that the way would be closer to the mechanism that the UNIDRA convention is using. So somehow saying, try to find a way to expand the logic behind the convention. This is my interpretation of the, of the, of the study. It's not something that would come out from, I mean, it's not expressly said, but in my understanding, the general recommendation and try to find a way to uh, use the same rationale that you have in in conventions like the UNESCO and the UNIDRA also to solve these kind of issues. Uh, but just to go into concrete examples, uh, I'm, I've used just three of them uh, as a beginning because they were extremely, extremely well known. But uh, if you see that UK, for instance, as a, uh, what I said, took the approach of the automatic authorization with automatic automatic immunity with automatic immunity it doesn't mean that uh, uh, there is no condition to be respected under a number of conditions uh, i apologize i see this morning there was a mistake it's not of course kidnapping so that should read in the slide procedure so it is a general law the one that you have in the uk that applies to any kind of cultural goods for temporary uh, exhibit and temporary and, and, and it is an immunity uh, in all civil and criminal criminal procedure. It's uh, the only uh, limitation that, that you have is that in any event, you, the, the state should not uh, conflict with the general obligation of international law. So of course, it is a general understanding, a general um, statement of uh, not adopting a legislation that is against the obligation coming from international law general as a as a statement in germany you have a different approach which is what uh, we call comfort letter approach uh, in fact germany starts from the uh, uh, prohibition to export uh, uh, cultural goods to the change that also takes, takes into consideration European legislation uh, that, uh, that we have. But they use the different approach of having a comfort letter for, from a ministry. So the difference is that on a case by case, under a decree, of course, regulated by, by some conditions, but they establish the, the uh, possibility to have immunity on specific goods by, by comfort letter. The result that you reach is uh, the same, but you might have different kinds of uh, legal challenges in the use of these two instruments. Uh, then you go to the US, which, has an, which is interesting, not only because it was the first, as far as I know, the first legislation on this, but because what is interesting in the US is that you have the special reference uh, to 
the need to show that the goods that benefit of immunity uh, are of artistic value and uh, there is a national interest for the state to use uh, to use the good so it is somehow they introduce uh, an, a specific element of uh, protection of a specific category and or at least they explicit they make they make it explicit which are the interests that justify the immunity but but the case that I wanted to see with you is next one, which is the Italian case. I'm using the Italian case because it is interesting. We don't have, we, in Italy, we don't have a, a law yet, but what is of interest is the process and the differences in, uh, in draft, draft bills that we had. In 2011-2012, we were close to reach a legislation on this. At the, at the beginning, the law uh, imposed a general authorization for immunity. Then uh, it was, at the very end, it was changed to the mechanism of the comfort letter. It didn't work. We did not adopt the law. Now, in 2018, they started with uh, a new project, which is not approved yet, so we are still in a sort of limbo. But what is interesting is that in 2018, they took into consideration the kind of issues that had, had raised in 2011 and 12, including the fact that uh, the former president of UNIDRA, Professor Mazzoni, went also with uh, Marina Schneider to, <coughs> to an audition where they had to explain <clears throat> whether there was, there was any implication on this law on the UNIDRA convention. And one of the points that they were making was that it would have been necessary or preferable to have a specific mention of the UNIDRA convention that it could not be enough to have a general reference of respect of international obligations and conventions. And you see in the 2018 draft, the specific mention of exoneration, of exemption of the proceedings and the coming from the UNIDRA convention from immunity. So it, the, if ever this law passes, it passes with a clear understanding that the proceedings under the UNIDRA uh, convention are not covered. You don't find this in the other laws that I show you. You, it, I mean, you don't because, because the, the, the countries I show you were not part to the, to the convention. But in any event, even in other drafts uh, where you have member states, member state to states that, uh, that signed the convention, you don't find this specific, this specific mention. This is, I think, the most important interest, the most interesting part, which is why the old project got some opposition in the parliamentary commissions. Uh, you see that because these are the issues at stake in my understanding everywhere. You see that both the constitutional com commission and the justice commission had to, uh, were opposing to some wording of the, of the project. The constitutional commission accepted was the <coughs> advice they gave was positive, but upon the condition that the rights of third parties would not be impaired, the rights to go to court, which uh, is not clear to apply. What the, it was a positive uh, advice, but it was unclear what they wanted to mean, saying that because, in fact, any immunity for, from seizure automatically impairs the rights, of, the rights of third parties. That was even clearer with the Justice Commission, where they clearly said that at least for criminal action, that could not be possible. So the, the, the opinion was, in fact, the advice was negative, saying that this kind of provision would limit the rights at least, in, at least for criminal proceedings. And then we get to the fine, and again, the Foreign Affairs Commission that was making the same points and was, was asking for the Foreign Affairs Commission to to ask uh, Professor Mazzoni as president of UNIDRA to see. 
I, I'm running already out of time, so I'm just uh, asking you to see what I think is probably the best, uh, one of the best results we have now, which is the legislation in Australia, because what they tried to do was, in my understanding, exactly to try to cope with all the issues jointly. So the issues that are addressed by the international conventions and the issue of uh, immunity from seizures. This attempt to work on the two issues together, which is someone that, something that was already advised by the, COM, uh, the, by the mock committee. They also cover indigenous goods. Uh, we know that Australia has many legislation on that. They are pretty advanced on the field. And you do see that they try to put together the issue of protection of goods. They have different, um, they call it the class, class A, class B of, uh, of goods. And, uh, those that are on class A cannot be uh, protected, uh, cannot, cannot be immune, immune from CESUR, while those that come from, some of those that come from indigenous goods can be protected exactly to get to the result, to get back at least for temporary periods, goods that come from indigenous communities for the possibility to show them and get them back at least on a temporary basis. I close, I'm sorry for being so fast in, in speaking, for, but the message is, it is still an extremely controversial issue. It, it shows some, uh, I mean, some loopholes in the sense that the convention did not address a few issues. And uh, this legislation might indeed interfere with the application of the, of the convention. But the debate is going, it is continuing, and uh, some states are trying indeed to cope with, uh, with uh, this issue. Thank you. I hope I, I, we save some time. Thank you, Maria Chiara. Um, um, right, so now we move on to the uh, next presentation. Um, it is going to be a presentation about uh, the 1995 Convention and its application in China, one specific jurisdiction, but one which has obviously an extraordinary uh, cultural heritage uh, and also one-fifth of the world population. In order to do that, we have Professor Wang Yunxia, who is uh, the director of the Institute of Cultural Heritage of UNESCO and uh, in, a professor in, in the Law School of Renmin University of China. Um, professor Wang Yunxia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind introduction. And uh, thanks, Marina, for letting me uh, involved in this significant conference. Uh, my paper is to study and evaluate its implementation in China, uh, which may be found in the proceedings later, I suppose. However, due to the time bound, my presentation will only focus on one of the legal issues, that is the transformation of the, conference, of the convention mechanism in domestic Chinese law. So generally speaking, the legal status of international treaty is not clear in China's legal system. The constitution doesn't mention the application of international treaties or the relationship between international law and the domestic laws. There are no principal provisions on how international treaties are implemented in China. As a result, we can see some degree of randomness in the implementation of the 1995 Unidual Convention. Some laws have been transformed into the domestic laws, while others have not. Next, I would like to share three examples uh, to explain this situation in a little bit more details. First example is that uh, cultural objects of illegal origins are not allowed to be traded or collected. Uh, of course, this is an example of well transformation. Since the 1990s, 
with the flourishing private collections, secret or illegal trading of cultural objects without asking the origins became very common due to the lax legal regulations on cultural object trading and the influence of in the influence of traditional antique trading habits. After China's accession to the 1970 and the 1995 conventions, the trading of cultural objects was increasingly standardized by laws. The Cultural Relics Protection Law, which amended in 2002, officially recognized that individuals have the right to acquire cultural relics through inheritance, donation, exchange, or transfer, and the purchase from cultural relic stores or auction houses. Cultural relic is the legal phrase in current Chinese law of cultural objects, uh, by the way. The cultural object franchise is carried out that only those cultural relic stores or auction houses that meet legal requirements strictly approved by cultural heritage administrative authorities are qualified to engage in the transaction of cultural objects. The regulations on the implementation of the cultural relics protection law requires cultural object uh, oper operators to record the details of transaction, including origins, prices, and information of purchase. And such records should be kept for at least 75 years. Such a provision is obviously related to the declaration China has made when acceded to the 1995 convention which states that the claim for the restitution of cultural objects related to monument or archeological site or public collection should be subject to the 75 year limitation. The transaction records should be kept in accordance with the limitation time so as to provide certain evidence for the restitution claim. In the year of 2016, the measures for the administration of cultural rags auction listed that stolen, illegal, excavated, and uh, smuggled the cultural relics or the cultural relics belonging to China that were plundered in history as one of the eight categories of objects prohibited from auctioning. Uh, this is follow the spirit of the 1917 convention as well as the 1995 convention. The second example is about the rule of bona fide possession. It has not been transformed into Chinese dynastic laws. Paragraph one of Article three of the 1995 Convention clearly stipulates that the possessor of a cultural object which has been stolen shall return it. It means that the Convention does not recognize that anyone can acquire the ownership of a stolen cultural object, no matter he is a bona fide possessor or not, because the stolen cultural object must be returned to its original owner. As pointed by Professor Linda Prott, it is one of the most significant provisions of the convention because it changes the traditional system of bona fide acquisition in many civil law countries. By balancing of the interests of the original owner and the current possessor, Article 4 provides certain relief for the bona fide possessor, 
that as long as he can prove his due diligence in acquiring the cultural object, he can get reasonable compensation when returning it to the original owner. However, in China's domestic laws, there are no explicit exception of bona fide acquisition for stolen property. On the one hand, each of, on the one hand, either the property law of 2007 or the civil code of 2020 includes a provision that lost, drafting, and buried objects should be returned, which excludes these three kinds of properties from the scope of bona fide acquisition. Unfortunately, there is no mentioning whether the stolen property is excluded from the scope of bona fide acquisition. According to the legislative interpretation, this issue should be stipulated by criminal law other than civil law. And the owners of the stolen or robbed properties could recover their properties through judicial procedure. However, as many stolen objects cannot be found in time, they may be traded secretly again and again before the thief was captured. This legal loophole inevitably brings potential dangers to the transaction security. On the other hand, the cultural relics protection law does not concern the issue that whether the ownership of the stolen or illegally sourced cultural relics can be acquired through bona fide possession, let alone the due diligence obligation of the bona fide possessor or the reasonable compensation. Therefore, many stolen cultural objects become great collections via trading under the table due to the fact that bona fide acquisition has not excluded clearly by the laws they will not be confiscated unless they are found to be involved in criminal laws. They are found to be involved in criminal cases. However, they are not under the legal protection because individuals are not allowed to obtain cultural objects of illegal origins according to the cultural relics protection law. Therefore, they can only be transferred under the table forever or illegally exported for making a profit. The third example is about the limitation of action. The related Chinese domestic laws are inconsistent with the convention. Article 3 of the 1995 Convention provides for two kinds of time limitation of action. One is relative limitation period, which stipulates that any claim for restitution shall be, brought, shall be brought within three years from the time when the claimant knew the location of the cultural object and the identity of its possessor. The other is absolute time bar, which means in any case, the claim must be made within a period of 50 years. However, a claim for restitution of cultural object forming an integral part of a monument or archaeological site or belonging to a public collection shall not be subject to absolute time bar unless a contracting state declares to follow a time limitation of 75 years. Unfortunately, the provisions on limitation of action in China's domestic laws are not 
consistent with that of the Convention. Both the general provisions of the civil law promulgated in 2017 and the latest civil code stipulate that the claimant shall bring a lawsuit within three years from the time when he knows that his right has been infringed. If it has been more than 20 years since his right was infringed, the court will no longer accept his claim. However, if any special law has different provisions, the court will deal with it according to the provisions of that law. Unfortunately, as one of the special laws, the Cultural Relics Protection Law does not concern the issue of limitation of action. Therefore, in China, only the general provisions of civil laws can be applied to the litigation concerning the restitution of cultural objects. It is completely a disadvantage to its original owner. Now I'm going to conclude my presentation. It is the fact that China has made its best efforts to stop illicit trafficking of cultural objects, including to improve its legal instruments to protect its heritage. Signed by literal agreements and the MOUs with many member states of 1917 Convention and the 1995 Convention as well. Launched three to six months national wide combates to fight against the cultural object related crimes every year since 2009. However, compared to many importing countries, China is not ready to integrate with the convention mechanism completely. Some studies have shown that the convention has had a significant impact on legislations of non-contracting states, including the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Belgium, as well as well as EU directives and some judicial precedents of the United Kingdom and the United States, as mentioned by many participants yesterday. By contrast, China has not introduced the important rules of the convention into its domestic laws, especially the rules of bona fide possession and the time limitation. Uh, the good news is that the Cultural Relics Protection Law is under the process of sweeping amendment. I hope that in the near future, the revised Cultural Relics Protection Law could make some significant changes in these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for sticking exactly to the time. Um, this uh, very, very interesting intervention which I'm sure will uh, generate uh, some debate as to how a convention which is directly applicable would need to replicate some of its provisions within its domestic law in order to be enforceable, uh, unlike the 1970 convention. So perhaps there could be some debate on this later, but we'll move on to the next um, um, presentation. We are taking a twist and uh, a turn and a different approach to, to the um, issue that um, we have gathered here to analyze, which is that of the, in part of the industry. Uh, the next speaker, Joanna van der Lande, is chairman of Antiquity Dealers Association of the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, she's going to speak to us about uh, the last 25 years of antiquities trade. The floor is yours. Okay, I'll just share the screen. I would like to thank Unidua and Marina Schneider in particular for inviting me to contribute to this 25th anniversary conference. Not a lawyer, I can contribute a perspective from within the antiquities trade. I can only touch on some of the important issues today in the time available, but everything I talk about will be expanded on in the article speakers have been invited to submit. 
but in broad terms, these are the areas I'll be talking about. I've been involved with the antiquities trade for more than 25 years, both for dealers and auction houses. And during this period, I've seen significant changes in how the antiquities market operates, as well as the introduction of new laws. Over the years, I've seen increased government, academic and media scrutiny into the illicit antiquities trade. The events surrounding the Arab Spring and the subsequent increase of looting and theft, followed by the iconoclastic actions of Daesh, put the antiquities market in the spotlight as never before. The situation undoubtedly provided a useful opportunity for some to conflate two issues, lack of documentary provenance with recent looting. Illicit cultural goods are toxic for the legitimate trade. Our reputation is easily tarnished, which is everything in this business. It is in our interest more than most to prevent looted antiquities surfacing on the market. This is why art trade associations have codes of ethics. My trade association established a code of conduct, conduct when, I, when it was founded in 1982, and we've since made it more robust. However, the antiquities trade can understand why we are viewed harshly. We also read the headlines. But the existence of an antiquities market is real. Millions of objects are legally circulating, more than enough to serve the market. The genie cannot be put back in the lamp. But for many years, if not decades, the legitimate antiquities market has played its part in fighting illicit activity. As a member of the UK's Ministerial Illicit Trade Advisory Panel, I advised the UK government to accede to the 1970 UNESCO Convention. In the UK, we have a constructive relationship with the Metropolitan Police and Government Department. Globally, apart from the larger auction houses, the trade is mostly made up of micro to medium sized businesses. While the UK has a well developed mechanism for the trade to communicate with government departments via the British Art Market Federation, this is not replicated in most other countries. While there might be a perception the art market is powerful, this is not how it feels from within the art market. And we find it particularly hard to accept the unwillingness by many to really understand how the legitimate market, that is the intermediary between previous owner and future owner, has operated for generations and why provenance information has frequently not been retained. There is also little understanding of the mutually beneficial relationship between the trade, academics and the museum sector. Such relationships really matter to us. Although in the past 25 years, there has been increasing disapproval to the point where many academics are actively discouraged from fraternizing with the trade and not just the antiquities trade. This can only be to the detriment of scholarship, understanding and transparency. For clarity's sake, I'll briefly touch on definitions, because when I refer to antiquities, I'm talking about archaeological artefacts, excluding coins, from Egypt, Europe and the Near East, from prehistory until the fall of the Roman Empire through the Byzantine period. While governments, academics, journalists and bloggers all call all archaeological artefacts antiquities, their definitions do not mirror how the art market operates, and this causes issues with data, perception, and the message doesn't always get through to areas of the art market it needs to. Most data re uh, reporting refers to cultural goods, cultural heritage, or cultural property, which contains an even wider array of goods that in no way meet the UNIDWA or UNESCO definition, but it has to be of importance. The term illicit means different things to different people. An object legitimately on the market is often called illicit by some, but with no clear definition of term. It creates the impression the antiquities market is saturated with artifacts which are not legally on the market, which it is not. If the trade talks about provenance, it refers to collecting history. Antiquities have been collected for hundreds of years with some collection forming the basis of public museums. While if archaeologists talk of provenance, they refer to the exact fine spot of an object, something that is rarely known for privately owned antiquities. 
A lack of evidence of provenance cuts to the heart of the problem for the trade. There are millions of objects in circulation without much or any paperwork. When I started out in my career, provenance was only listed in a catalogue if it had belonged to somebody of some importance, and this applied to relatively few objects on the market. Unfortunately, over the years, even this information has often been lost, which is why a dealer's name or a past auction is often used as provenance. It is really tragic to have lost such information, but research does bring some success in piecing together stories, and this inevitably enhances an object's value. A significant amount of time is spent by auction house specialists and dealers in researching provenance. In short, good provenance is good for business, while insufficient provenance frequently renders an object either unsaleable or has a detrimental effect on its value. It's really been in the past 10 years that the picture has changed dramatically with a much greater emphasis on due diligence, with auction houses and dealers now focusing even greater attention and resources on establishing provenance as best they can. This can be a good thing, but how far should or can this go? Is it practical to expect the same amount of due diligence for an Egyptian bead an arrowhead or an ancient seal worth less than 500 euros or a marble sculpture of Aphrodite worth 50,000 euros? Should a non-professional be able to be held to the same standard as a dealer when buying cultural property? The antiquities trade is not the exclusive domain of the rich and in fact is one of the areas of the art market where it's possible to buy something ancient for less than 100 euros. Yet the trade is now expected by some to produce documentary evidence that an object left its country of origin legally or to provide proof that it was acquired before 1970 or 2000 when there were no legal requirements to keep any document and the object might have negligible commercial value. I'll show you four slides of export licenses from Egypt, the Lebanon and Cyprus. The first is from Egypt. You can see that it lists 25 clay statues and alabaster vessels in six crates. How can these be linked to objects in circulation? The next two slides show one consignment exported from Lebanon. The first um, slide has long lists of unidentifiable objects. Well, this second page, you can see mention of 680 coins and 150 beads. How can these be linked to objects in circulation? These two export licenses from Cyprus dating from 1955 and 1975 have more detailed description. Nevertheless, how can these be linked to objects in circulation? Export licenses from source countries are not actually that helpful if they exist at all. They are rare documents with no identifying photograph, often no description, seldom any measurements, and a sheet listing unidentifiable objects makes it impossible to link them with objects currently in circulation. If you own art and antiques, do you have any documentation proving it's yours or when and where you acquired it? You have receipts proving an unbroken line of legal ownership. For the millions of antiquities in private collections, which have been circulating for decades or centuries, the same issues apply. Ultimately, we want an art market which is transparent about the known provenance, not one where people fear being shamed in the press if the provenance falls short of the expectations of trade critics, but not the law. With the art fairs, auction houses, the internet and social media, the market has never been more open to scrutiny. While many objects are turned down by the antiquities trade if they do not have acceptable provenance, a solution must be found for the millions of orphan objects. These are objects in circulation, but without sufficient paperwork, which does not mean they are illegally on the market. On the contrary, for most of them, legal statutes of limitation have long since passed. You don't have to like the trade or agree with it in order to recognise this truth. In recent years, the trade has seen concerning developments 
with prestigious art fairs raided, objects seized without a clear reason and in front of members of the public, maximizing embarrassment and publicity. Dealers' galleries have been raided with property seized, private homes of collectors and dealers have been raided with families intimidated some at six o'clock in the morning. Members of the trade have been treated like common criminals, some being held under counter-terrorism laws, which means they can be detained for longer. Meanwhile, academics regularly take photographs of objects on dealer stands at fairs, and only a few weeks ago, one gave false names to different dealers who grew suspicious and tracked him down to working for a prominent museum in the UK. Each of these scenarios has occurred this year in 2020, but they are not a new experience for the trade. We hear of seizures in media headlines, but we are not hearing of convictions or what happened to seized objects that are often quietly returned to the dealer or collector, but by then, the reputational damage has already been done. It is destabilizing and is creating a climate of fear, which could be deliberate. The legitimate antiquities market has changed beyond recognition in the past 25 years and continues to do so. It has been all too easy to condemn how the trade operated in the past century and with some legitimacy, but the willingness today to link the legitimate trade to funding terror, drug dealing and the illegal arms trade has been taken too far. There are those who have wanted to see an end to the private ownership of antiquities for years and then there are those who are working to support a long-standing but ethical trade in antiquities. It is my view that unless the well-scrutinized and legitimate trade is supported and encouraged to flourish, could be two profoundly negative results, driving the market underground, which would make it impossible to police, leading to the loss of a valuable partner in the fight against crime. And secondly, this would not stop polluting or protect cultural heritage. Over the years, a great deal of time and money has been spent on assessing the scope and scale of the illicit trade in cultural property. And while we could argue about the detail, the available data tells us the problem is not as big as is so often reported. RAND, an independent American nonprofit global policy think tank, recently published a report which states that figures so often quoted by some journalists and researchers are at odds with their findings. Using open source data, the findings suggest the market for all antiquities, that is both licit and illicit, is at most a few hundred million dollars annually. The figures are broadly in line with those of other studies conducted by the European Commission and the trade. It therefore cannot be true that the illicit trade is worth hundreds of millions of dollars, let alone billions of dollars. It is often said the illicit antiquities market is second only to the trade in drugs and weapons. Again, this is simply not true. If you take a look at this World Customs Organization illicit trade report from the last few years, antiquities fall within the category of cultural heritage, a sector which, according to the 2019 report, amounts to just 0.2% of the global illicit trade, which you can see in green on this slide. Cultural heritage includes flora and fauna, works of art and household goods, with archaeological artefacts forming a tiny fraction of this section, which you can see in this slide here. One of the most grotesque accusations levelled against the trade in recent years is that we are funding terrorist activity. The term blood antiquities has been emotively used along with scores of headlines and research papers telling their readers the illicit antiquities trade is funding terrorists to the tune of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. In fact, these figures have been discredited by an increasing number of people, including the RAND report. There is in fact minimal evidence of any terrorist funding from the sale of antiquities, as has also been confirmed by two studies from the European Commission. While any funding stream for terrorists need to be shut off, responses to the problem must be proportionate. This is why such data matters. There are a myriad of laws already in existence with yet more on the horizon, including the anti-money laundering directive. The impact of bringing the art market into the regulated sector should not be underestimated, but these laws must be interpreted correctly and administered with fairness 
As Professor Raymond Curl puts it, the removal of objects from bona fide owners without due compensation is wrong in law and wrong morally. It also runs counter to Unidwa's Article 4, which makes provision for fair compensation under certain circumstances. While the Unidwa Convention has not been ratified by major market countries, many of the principles have become a benchmark with a new legal framework, but without some of the benefits protecting private individuals from claims and the provision of compensation. Other objects, though legally on the market, face the condemnation of trade critics, some whom have publicly stated they seek to destroy the value of an object by publishing articles if it does not have a satisfactory provenance. The same people regularly tip off the police who are obliged to follow up cases even when there is no clear evidence of wrongdoing. This is creating a perception there is a disproportionate amount of illicit activity within the antiquities market compared with other parts of the market when antiquities makes up less than 0.5% of the global art and antiques market. There have been many conferences on the illicit trade since 1995 but there has been a tendency to call for more regulation with more restrictions. Yet this is creating a new moral dilemma which affects human and private property rights. We are more than aware there are problems with some inherited from a previous era and others current and ongoing. But with resources as they are, the focus should be on preventing recently looted objects from entering the market. This is achievable and has the wholehearted support of the legitimate Trade. Critical to this and to build trust and greater transparency is resolving the status of these orphan antiquities circulating on the market. We want to root out any criminal activity which is spoiling it for the rest of the market and damaging our reputation, but there needs to be a fair and realistic solution for these objects. First and foremost, a clear separation and distinction must be made between objects legally on the market and those which have been recently looted and are obviously illegal, enabling legally circulated objects to be treated without fear of condemnation. Drawing a line in the sand at 2010, perhaps, when the recording of provenance became routine in the trade and before the Arab Spring would be a realistic date and could help solve the orphan problem. While this might be morally distasteful to many and appear to legitimize past wrongs, and while it might be counterintuitive, I think it is the only way to make meaningful progress. The other issue, of course, is compensation. There have been many returns to source countries, and in the majority of cases, causing considerable financial loss to the owner. Such returns are often not necessary for legal reasons, but have often occurred because the dealer or collector felt it was the right thing to do. But financial loss is not possible for everyone to absorb and it seems likely to become more of an issue as time passes. So in case a country seeks the return of a cultural object for which the chance of successful legal action has expired, there should be a system of arbitration or mediation to reach agreement to fairly compensate the lawful owner. This would probably be more successful than endless costly and often fruitless court cases. You would find the antiquities trade would welcome a resolution to the orphan issue as well as the issue of compensation. Something radical needs to happen, make a difference, so that resources can be focused where they need to be, which is to protect vulnerable cultural heritage in situ and to prevent criminal activity. In conclusion, the influence of UNIDWA has clearly been far reaching over the past 25 years, with so much emphasis now on due diligence within the art market. It has been very encouraging to have been invited to contribute to this conference. Ultimately, dealers and collectors are custodians of cultural property. We want it to be looked after. We have more in common with our critics than many might think. There needs to be a renewed and meaningful partnership with the trade. The time has come to remove the trade from the sidelines. We are, I believe, integral to any solution, but issues of fundamental difficulty for the antiquities market we need to be tackled in order for us to really be able to move in the same direction. This would be a real legacy for UNIDWA at 25 years. I would like to thank UNIDWA for this invitation to contribute to the conference and to you all for taking the time to listen. Thank you very much, Ms. Martin Lande. Um, 
um, we have the final um, presentation of the day, also from the industry, but from a different side. Uh, uh, Mr. Martin Wilson, who is Chief General Counsel at Philips Auction House in London. Uh, Mr. Phillips, the floor is yours. I would please ask you to uh, limit your intervention to the uh, agreed 15 minutes. Thanks. Uh, first of all, um, I'd like to express my thanks and congratulations to the org organisers of this incredibly important conference. It's a, it's a real privilege to be allowed to speak here at the 25th anniversary celebration. So first, a little bit of personal history from my side. I worked as an in-house lawyer at Christie's, the auction house, where I experienced firsthand the complexities of the trade in ancient objects. I currently work at the auctioneers Phillips, and it's probably worth saying that Phillips do not sell antiquities. Uh, we don't, we specialize in 20th century art. So I'm not speaking on behalf of Phillips, um, nor am I speaking on behalf of the antiquities trade, but really my personal views as a, as a lawyer and an author. So what I'm gonna try and do in this presentation is to describe the international and uh, local legislative measures which are relevant uh, to, the, to uh, the UK. And the reason I'm focusing on the UK is because at the end of the day, this country is by some distance the largest art market in Europe. Uh, and it's therefore really important in the context of what we're discussing to understand how these legal restrictions have impacted not just the illicit trade, but also the licit trade. Um, and it's also very important, I think, in order to understand the impact or potential impact of Unitois on a market country to understand its, its uh, legislative framework. So I think it's probably worth uh, reiterating something which I think most of us take as read, which is that surveys, certainly from a public perspective, have shown that overwhelmingly the public is against the trade in illicitly removed or stolen cultural property and in favour of its return to the stolen, uh, to the country of origin. And so it's, this is also widely shared, as we've heard, by politicians, by lawyers, by academics, and it may surprise you also by the art trade. The difficulty, having established the issue of principle, is that there are sort of very divergent views on uh, the detail of how you legislate to deal with this. And we've heard uh, from many of the speakers some of the complexities around this. What do we mean by illicit? What point in time can a claim no longer be pursued from? Who should bear the burden uh, of proving wrongdoing? Um, should the right to return be automatic? Should the possessor be compensated? So I guess the question is, do these differing views really matter? And I think these are issues of principle, so shouldn't we be legislating to reflect those principles? Well, yes, it does matter in the context of international law, because for international agreements to work, there has to be a level of consensus. And that, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, means that any attempt to legislate needs buy-in from both sides uh, of the argument. So, Let's start very quickly with a speedy journey through the legislation with um, the piece of legislation that we're probably all most familiar with, which is the 1970 UNESCO Convention. It was a huge achievement. Um, it committed all its signatories to preventative me measures to impede the illicit import and export uh, of cultural property and to put into place measures to return illicit cultural property imported after the entry into force of the convention. But as we also know, to achieve this, UNESCO was also born of some degree of compromise. It didn't apply to off objects which had been tra trafficked before 1970. It left it to signatory countries to decide how and when to implement their, their local measures. And it wasn't able to incorporate a provision uh, requiring countries to prohibit the import of objects without an export license. So some were critical of the extent of compromise that was required in order to get the UNESCO Convention across the line, but it was extremely successful in, its, in terms of its broad appeal. Some 129 member states, including market, market countries, and when I say market countries, I'm talking about the large market countries, were able to sign up to its provisions. And in doing so, this was the first really crucial 
milestone in the fight against the illicit trade. That was, of course, followed by Unitois in 1995, which was equally important and the necessary next step in building upon the success of the UNESCO Convention. Unitois sought in particular to uh, address some of the concerns that UNESCO didn't go far enough. Uh, it introduced some new concepts which would make it easier uh, and more straightforward to recover illicitly removed cultural property. Um, chief amongst these, which we've heard, and I won't go into detail on them again, were the automatic rights to restitution, uh, to some extent a reversal of the burden of proof, um, um, a, a, a right to compensation where the, where the possessor was able to show good faith and due diligence. So Unitify was seen really as less of a compromise than UNESCO 1970 and a necessary next building uh, block. It was very favorably received as a further step in the right direction for, by campaigners uh, for stronger rights of restitution. An obstacle, however, was and still remains uh, that the countries with large art markets, including the UK, felt that some of the provisions in Unitois were inconsistent with their legal norms and ultimately felt unable to sign up uh, to the convention. Now, whether one agrees with that or not, this has meant that Unitois influence with large mar art, art markets like the UK remains limited. However, it does have influence, even if not in a legislative format, in many of the principles that it has brought forward. The 2014 EU directive uh, was introduced to provide a procedure for the return of cultural property within the EU. And this directive applies automatically to all EU member states and requires them to cooperate in the return of qualifying objects. It's probably worth mentioning, certainly from my experience, that in the UK, this, pr this process is surprisingly rarely invoked by countries seeking the return of cultural property from the UK. So I'm now going to turn to UK legislation, which has been specifically enacted to counter the illicit trade in cultural property. Surprisingly, until 2003, there was no legislation in place in the UK specifically aimed at trading in or handling illicit cultural property. Any prosecution up until that point had relied upon the general criminal law of theft and handling stolen goods. I say surprising because in 1970, the UK had signed up to the UNESCO Convention committing to introduce legislation to return illicit cultural property. However, this was largely rectified uh, between 2003 and 2016 when prompted in most cases by the terrible events in the Middle East, the UK government introduced four laws criminalizing the handling of illicit cultural property, including laws implementing the commitments made 33 years earlier in the UNESCO Convention and, uh, incredibly, 63 years earlier in the Hague Convention on Pro Protecting Cultural Property in Armed Conflicts. So a key feature of this uh, band of legislation and a crucial distinction from the law of theft in the UK was that with the exception of the Dealing in Cultural Objects Offences Act, the possessor did not need to be in bad faith to be convicted of a criminal offence. It was sufficient that he was negligent or failed to appreciate the importance of factors indicating uh, that an item was of illicit origin. So in the UK we've gone from a situation where we had no meaningful legislation directed at illicit trade and cultural property to a situation where we now have an abundance of legislation under which to prosecute wrongdoing in this area. And most importantly the threshold for a conviction is now extremely low. Criminal convictions can be secured under most of this legislation without the possessor being in bad faith. The civil courts have done their part too, and through the famous Barakat case, which has also been mentioned before, 
uh, they've shown that they're prepared to order the return of cultural property in response to civil claims by countries who are seeking restitution of property which has been illegally exported or stolen from the country where the country can prove ownership. So with that background, one would expect to see a correspondingly significant increase in prosecutions and civil claims for restitution. No legislation is effective unless it's effectively policed. So it's worth looking at the resources which are being devoted to the policing of this complex issue. The principal responsibility falls to the really excellent and experienced Met Police in London, the Art and Antique Squad. But there's a problem. There are only four officers. Yes, you heard it right. Four officers in the entire antique, Art and Antique Squad devoted uh, to this issue and their resourcing is correspondingly thin. So with that level of resourcing, you will not be surprised to know that despite the abundance of laws and the low threshold for conviction, prosecutions are still a rare event. And I, as I've said earlier, claimant con countries seem to be reluctant to pursue civil restitution claims through the UK civil courts. So despite the existence of four sets of local legislation targeting crimes on cultural property, there's only been a handful of prosecutions involving cultural property offences in the UK. Where the prosecutions have taken place, the police have also preferred to prosecute under other legislation, such as the Theft Act or for fraud. So the new legislation is not proving to be a very much good for prosecutions. It's also interesting to look at who's been prosecuted. The two major cases were the successful prosecution of Christopher Cooper in 2006 and Neil Kingsbury in 2013. Neither were professional traffickers forming part of an organized network. Cooper was a petty criminal and Kingsbury was an opportunist. So why are there so few prosecutions? It's not because of lack of legislation, nor is it because there's a difficulty in proving guilt. It may be that we've overestimated the extent of criminal activity in this area, but personally I believe that it's principally because in the UK in any event, detection and prosecution of cultural property offences is chronically under-resourced. So what's the future? We're awaiting the implementation of the EU import licensing directive, which applies to cultural goods created or discovered outside of the EU. You'll remember that cultural goods of more than 200 years old originating outside the EU will need certain certification and documentation to enter the EU, including evidence of lawful export from the source country. In many cases, unfortunately, that is going to be an impossible requirement. And my concern is like all very stringent import and export legislation, there is a risk that legitimate objects are simply pushed underground and perhaps more seriously, it's unlikely to affect the illicit trade, which simply will smuggle objects as it always has done. As for the UK, it's unlikely to affect the UK due to Brexit. So perhaps we can look to money laundering as, as the future solution. The fact that the art market is now regulated for money laundering purposes may also provide more transparency and maybe fewer opportunities for traffickers to use the art market. However, there again, I believe that the principal risks to the art market of money laundering are not in the antiquities market, but in the higher value transactions in other categories of art. So my own view is that we have enough legislation um, it's more than sufficient to prosecute anyone found handling illicit cultural property. There's precedent also for civil claims. What's required now is a significant investment in the investigation and detection of cultural property offences and claims. I'd also finally say that there's been a major change, uh, as Joanna referred to earlier, in attitudes to due diligence and provenance in the art market in recent years. That has resulted not from the threat of prosecution or the law. It's largely because of public perceptions and market forces. Reputational damages, cancelled sales and legal action uh, are great focuses of the minds of members of the art market. 
there has been a seismic shift in the last 20 years in the art market on the question of due diligence of, uh, of ancient art. Whether or not one agrees that that shift has been great enough, the single most effective way of ensuring that illicit cultural property does not enter the legitimate art market is the due diligence which the art market participants are currently carrying out. I feel that, that what is extremely important at this juncture, as Joanna mentioned, is the building of stronger partnerships. I realise that if you feel strongly about the repatriation of cultural property, it may be very difficult to regard those who sell art as potential partners rather than opponents in the fight against the illicit trade. But the reality is that those, that, that those involved in the fight in the illicit trade may be surprised at the extent to which their aims are shared by the art market. And more importantly, they can only win this fight by engaging to a greater extent with the legitimate art market. So I would suggest that the next step should be a joint forum under the auspices of UNITOIR and UNESCO in which the art market, law enforcement and the stakeholder countries are in a safe space able to work together to develop effective ways uh, of combating the, the illicit trade. An initiative of this kind would I think bring about real change and build upon the aspirations and spirit of the excellent UNESCO and UNITOIR conventions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson, for your most interesting presentation. Um, so uh, we are a good half an hour late, and I'm afraid I'm, we're going to have to make up for some of that during our uh, coffee pause, which is going to be reduced to a bit more than 10 minutes. Uh, so I would suggest that uh, we resume at 11.25. May I ask for the kindness of the previous speakers uh, to remain to the extent that they can until the end of the session, because the Q&A session will be after the next session, uh, around 12.30, a bit earlier than that. If that would be possible, uh, we would uh, mostly appreciate it. We can't have the Q&A now, and it was not foreseen anyway in the, um, in the agenda. Thank you. So we'll uh, see each other again in uh, 11 minutes, 11.25. Thank you, <laughs> and apologies. Um, so, in the interest of time, let's crack on this last session or part of the session of the conference. This last part um, is going to start with uh, the presentation from uh, Linda Albertson, Ch Chief Executive Officer of the Association of Research into C Crimes Against Art, ARCA. Um, and it's going to be on the uh, convention and the role of civil society. Miss um, Alverson, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Unidra for inviting ARCA to come. I'm going to keep my um, thanks short because I want to make sure I use all the minutes if that's possible. Um, Marina kindly asked me back several months ago now to, to speak about uh, civil society or civil society organizations and their interface with the UNIDWA Convention. So I'm gonna try and pick upon some of the things that we've already talked about previously, but also look at it from an outsider's perspective because we are not um, looking at the instruments themselves in the way lawyers would, but more as an outsider observer. And so we have a slightly different perspective in some cases. Earlier, um, Dr. Gersenblith, presented this particular commodities pyramid slide. And I'm going to stick with uh, pyramids a lot in this presentation because I'm going to use um, the country of Egypt as an example, as it relates to some of the work that we do and civil society organizations in general. So we were shown previously a looting pyramid scheme, basically looking at antiquities as a commodity. And that's an important word and it's a charged word, but I think it's an acceptable word because in some cases these antiquities, when they're trafficked illicitly, illicitly are basically commodities. And, and then we'll look at, you know, when we talk about the 1970s convention, which everybody has emphasized in these previous presentations as a starting point, it too was the base of a pyramid. Okay, so 1970s was a start the next slide again, I'm going to go kind of fast on these first ones. 
Then we have the 1995, which kind of built upon 1970, again, forming an infrastructure that is there in place as a guide map that can be used and we recommend wholeheartedly should be ratified by member states. Go on to the next slide. Now we look at how civil society fits into our own pyramid. So we have the state actors, we have the market, which we just had two representatives from market organizations, which represent you know, the buying public in this particular circumstance. And then we have civil service or civil society groups um, that are mobilized for a lot of different reasons, for passion, for um, academic research, um, as advisories to public authorities. And in a lot of cases, we sit in this kind of neither space because we're neither one nor the other. And that can be difficult in some ways, but it also can provide a lot of insight that is useful when people are looking at should they ratify the UNODRA Convention. So if we move on to the next one. Okay. Civil society actors or CSO organizations are oftentimes given very simple definitions of what they should be doing. They should be de disseminating information to stakeholders. They can publish information or serve as force multipliers, which is a term the military uses often case. They also sometimes can raise you know, visibility about the importance of the UNIDWA Convention or the UNESCO Convention or the Hague Convention, but we can help amplify that voice from an outsider's perspective or a more neutral, less charged space. But the reality is when you're a CSO, sometimes it's like looking at a picture. You're kind of on the outside. And I want that to sink in for a second because just because you're on the outside looking at something doesn't mean that you cannot observe correctly or that your observations are inaccurate. Especially when your observers are in multiple countries because when you're in multiple countries and you hear the same problem again and again and again related to how the market interacts, then there's probably some validity and truth to what you're hearing, especially when it's heard over and over again. But where we fit, we have those nice previous uh, statements about what we should be doing. Should we be a force multiplier? Can we promote information? But oftentimes people in CSO organizations are kind of put on this type of an access. We can either stay on the sideline, as you saw with that first picture in the museum, just looking at what's happening from the outside, or we can be an active player, um, just as we are today, you know, when we're invited by UNIDWA to come and speak on these issues. And in between those two axes, we can either be confrontational and aggressive and disruptive, or we can be cooperative and we can help. We can help law enforcement. We can help the market to understand that there are some issues that need to be addressed. It all depends on which place on that access you choose to work or any CSO chooses to work. My organization works on the cooperative side. We don't want to impede law enforcement investigations. We want to facilitate law enforcement investigations. We want to facilitate restitutions on a voluntary basis if that is you know, an acceptable alternative. But we want to be a player. We don't just want to be an observer. So how we set that tone, we need to have a collaborative relationship with people. And ARCA works really hard to do that on an international level. So we facilitate investigations where we can. We try not to be antagonistic, but when I say not be antagonistic, that doesn't mean that I candy coat my words. And anybody that knows me knows that I'm pretty frankly, um, frank spoken. I come from the South, we, we can be polite, but we are direct. How we can build capacity in the normal ways of echoing um, the organization. So this is an example of just, you know, a, a public service announcement that we made announcing the ratification of serious signing of the UNIDWA Convention through our blog. So we present these kind of like public service announcements that we hope kind of engage the public and involve people in this very critical work that UNIDWA is doing. More concentrated um, documentation that we do to build capacity. We, we put, produce an annual um, journal of art crime two times per year, 
highlighting academic articles, highlighting research, highlighting trafficking investigation cases, and people can access those on an academic level in most major public libraries. We also participated in the formation of the Palgrave Handbook on Art Crime and now a new release from New Zealand that will come out on provenance research. Um, we can also work in capacity building environments and exchanges. So, you know, we can work with the International Observatory at ECOM. Now there's the new platform for Nature within the EU. You know, we could advise them as well. And those are very pertinent organizations that look to build capacities across transnational borders. Or sometimes we can do training themselves, and that's something that CSOs are often tasked with. And Marina was part of this training um, with us, with ARCA and um, ICOM, as well as it was sponsored by UNESCO in Beirut. It was for six country members to provide training on illicit trafficking, issues related to customs. The UNIDWA convention was highlighted by uh, Maria Schneider. And we spoke also with law enforcement investigators and customs authorities investigators to help teach people within um, at-risk states what can be done on a judicial basis, what cannot be done, or what can be done on an academic level to help facilitate this discussion. If we go on to the next slide, those kinds of conversations are super important. This is just an example of the, the different members from the different countries that were there. So we had Syria, we had Jordan, we had Lebanon, um, we had Turkey. Um, it was an opportunity to go through some exercises about just what a customs officer goes through when they try to look at objects as they come into the country. And this was a, a training program on a very short basis that was um, one week in duration. And we also do a 220 hour training, usually in the summer when there's not COVID. We also help identify objects within the market. And the object you see here is from the 2018 uh, Tefaf in Maastricht in the Netherlands. So sometimes because we are an outside observer, we have access to lots of different groups. So if you can move on to the next slide. Um, I was at Tafaf. I was speaking with Vijay Kumar, who is from another CSO called um, the India Pride Project. We were exchanging information about an object I identified at a dealer's stand. Uh, Vijay is in Singapore. Uh, he quickly contacted people in India who provided us with a matching document, which is the, the document you see in the upper right hand corner of an object that was stolen in 1961. So in 1961, there's not a whole lot you can do in the Netherlands given their current laws. It's beyond the UNESCO convention. It's beyond uh, the UNIDWA convention. It is also beyond most databases because in 1961, when the theft occurred was what, eight years, I think, sir, before the Carabinieri was formed? Okay. So eight years before the Carabinieri database, um, the, the Interpol database was 1995. So there were no records of these objects except at the retiree from the museum, okay? In that particular case, there was no legal mechanism to get that particular object back, but through working with Scotland Yard, working with the Dutch Metropolitan Police, working with Corrado up at Interpol, working with UNESCO, we were able to get that object voluntarily relinquished by the dealer and we kept their name out of the papers. So you can work together. It doesn't always have to be confrontational. This is another example. This is a piece that is now um, here in Rome at the, uh, uh, the Monte Martini Gallery at the moment. This is a restitution piece that didn't come home quite the way we wanted it to. Arca worked with uh, the, the fashion and jewelry company Bulgari uh, to purchase this object. Um, and it's not something we like to do, but sometimes it's the only way uh, to get an object back. This passed through a uh, UK dealer's hands who was known to deal with two illicit trafficking dealers that were based in Italy. And as you see in the upper left hand corner is the only documentation for this particular object with um, the auction house that had the lot up for sale. Um, and it refers to an Actarian, which is, yeah, it could be an antifix, but it's not clearly this particular antifix. So as the, the previous speakers mentioned, sometimes the documentation is quite vague. And when it's quite vague, that doesn't mean that the market is not using that quite vague documentation. There were two pieces of paper with this object. The one you see above, which is an inventory sheet and a redacted price list that just stated antifix. That was all Christie's had. But unfortunately, 
we had to buy it to get it back. Okay, I'm gonna keep my conversation short, but if we could play this like one minute video, and we, then I'm going to refer back to the pyramid we saw in the beginning. This is a video of a trafficker in Egypt. And this is an object that is for sale. Proof of life documentation to say that the object is fresh. An object very similar to this one was seized at Brafa this year, not this one. I close with a reminder that in January of 2020, Ashraf Omar El Darir was stopped in New York with 590 objects from Egypt. Since that time, we have identified 21 groups of El Darir provenanced objects circulating in the market from multiple ancient art dealers who accepted the false provenances supplied by this particular trafficker. So in my opinion, I would like to close by saying when we talk about market in source countries, perhaps maybe we should talk about market and harvest countries, because that's what they're doing. They're harvesting a finite amount, illicit traffickers, not necessarily illicit dealers that are abiding by the rules and legislation, but they're harvesting the cultural heritage of countries and they're taking that heritage away. And it's not like grapes harvested in Italy that are replanted every year. There's a finite number of pieces of ancient art in Egypt. So when you think of these pyramids, please remember these are people's cultural heritage and they need a voice in this discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Um, now um, the floor goes to someone uh, who really needs no presentation. Um, Marina Schneider, Principal Legal Officer here and the heart of the soul of the Convention. The floor is yours, Marina. Merci, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général. Je vais uh, le plus rapidement possible vous expliquer uh, quel est le rôle du nid droit et le suivi de cette Convention, puisque uh, le rôle du nid droit ne s'épuise pas après l'adoption du texte qui a été adopté sous ses auspices. Je commencerai par dire qu'UNIDROI n'est pas le dépositaire de cette convention. La convention indique clairement que le gouvernement italien est dépositaire, c'est donc auprès du gouvernement italien que les instruments doivent être déposés. Je le dis parce que ça a retardé plusieurs pays dans leur procédure. Mais si UNIDROI n'est pas le dépositaire, il en reste bien le garant des textes qui sont adoptés. Et pour suivre euh, cette convention, UNIDROI voit son rôle de différentes façons. Il fait des plaidoyers et de l'assistance aux États. Nous faisons de la formation autant que possible et nous faisons de la recherche, bien sûr, avec nos partenaires. Plaidoyer auprès des politiques, des, 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 sur le plan politique, évidemment, nous participons avec nos partenaires, comme vous le voyez, nous essayons de faire connaître cette convention le plus possible. Nous le faisons aussi à travers une, un groupe de travail informel qui a été créé à New York aux Nations Unies en 2017 et qui euh, devrait se réunir chaque année. Je dis « devrait » parce que ce n'est pas toujours très facile. Cette, euh, ce groupe de travail est euh, coordonné directement par UNIDRO et par son secrétaire général et il se nourrit. De, du projet académique dont nous avons parlé hier et sur lequel je vais revenir dans un instant. Nous faisons pour autant que possible de l'assistance technique. Nous avons, euh, après une formation en Égypte, euh, travaillé avec le gouvernement égyptien. Un groupe de travail interministériel a été créé. Nous avons fait un travail avec le Liban de compatibilité de la législation avec la Convention en vue de lancer la procédure d'adhésion. 
et euh, une visite d'études a été faite, j'ai été à, en Mongolie pour euh, faire une évaluation de la législation également au regard de la euh, convention et euh, le rapport explicatif et la convention ont été traduits euh, en Mongolie. Unidroit suit également euh, pour... Euh, Devenir partie à la Convention, nous l'avons très brièvement dit l'autre jour, il, faut, euh, il y a des déclarations qui sont obligatoires. Donc, Unidroit travaille, euh, accompagne les États dans leur procédure de, de ratification. Plusieurs euh, procédures ont été bloquées parce que ne pouvant être acceptées par le gouvernement italien en l'absence de ces déclarations obligatoires, qui sont, je le rappelle, comment un État veut que les demandes de restitution soient soumises et quelle est la législation d'interdiction d'exportation Ce n'est pas très compliqué, mais il faut le faire. Unidroit suit également euh, avec les États les éventuelles déclarations facultatives, sur lesquelles je ne reviendrai pas. Pour faire connaître les déclarations faites par les États, nous avons sur notre site Internet une matrice des déclarations. Quel pays a fait quelle déclaration C'est important pour la mise en œuvre de la Convention. Nous donnons également le plus d'informations possibles sur la mise en œuvre de la Convention par chaque pays qui a ratifié la Convention. Tout cela dans le cadre de l'accompagnement vers la ratification. Pour ce qui est de la, euh, euh, du renforcement des capacités, nous faisons avec nos partenaires, des, euh, nous participons à des conférences, nous participons à des formations qui sont euh, multidisciplinaires, si je puis dire. Nous en avons fait avec nos partenaires, notamment l'UNESCO, pour le marché de l'art, pour les autorités judiciaires et euh, les autorités de police. Nous l'avons fait auprès euh, des, des associations d'arbitrage, auprès des associations de collectionneurs. Nous avons également fait des euh, formations nationales ou régionales, et vous voyez indiqué ici, euh, avec les, car les Carabinieri, l'UNESCO et euh, l'ICROM, M. Ndoro nous en a parlé dans son introduction, euh, le, plus, euh, le plus possible. Pour tout ça, et pour expliquer ce qu'est la Convention, nous avons besoin de matériel, nous avons besoin de savoir de la part des États qui ont ratifié la Convention ou qui ont adhéré, comment ils l'appliquent. Et ça, c'est la partie difficile pour nous. Nous avons peu de retours. Donc, pour essayer d'en obtenir davantage, nous avons créé le projet académique sur la Convention d'Unidroit pour obtenir des informations, pour nourrir la réflexion aussi de, euh, du groupe de travail euh, aux Nations Unies. L'objectif, c'est de disséminer l'information auprès du plus grand nombre euh, de euh, cercles possibles, pas seulement les juristes, euh, les chercheurs, les étudiants, les juristes praticiens aussi, les juges, euh, comme Linda vient de le dire aussi, les autres, euh, la société civile, qui souvent est à l'origine d'une procédure de ratification par l'État. Euh, il faut que tout le monde connaisse cette convention, et c'est ce que nous faisons euh, avec le projet académique, en vue euh, de faciliter l'identification des meilleures pratiques en matière de mise en œuvre de cette convention. Le site du projet académique est, euh, existe, vous avez là les coordonnées, et nous avons besoin de vous. Euh, plusieurs partenaires ici, plusieurs personnes qui sont ici avec nous et qui nous suivent de loin sont partenaires de, cette, de ce projet académique. Plus nombreux nous serons, mieux nous travaillerons. Le, il est prévu d'avoir dans ce projet académique un groupe euh, particulier qui serait chargé un peu de coordonner les travaux de ce, de cette, de ce projet. Il n'a pas encore été mis en œuvre, mais c'est une chose que nous allons faire. Comment fait-on le suivi de cette convention L'article 20 de la convention prévoit la convocation d'un comité spécial chargé d'examiner le fonctionnement pratique de la convention. C'est un article qui est très succinct. En fait, il parle de convocation à l'initiative du président d'Unidroit ou à la demande de cinq États partis. Ses fonctions, c'est d'examiner sa mise en œuvre, pratique, 
la périodicité des réunions, le texte dit « périodiquement »,« at regular intervals » en anglais, rien de plus. Est-ce que forcément il faut, maintenant que nous avons 48 États partis, il y a matière à discuter de cela Quelle est sa composition Aucune indication dans le texte. Euh, Est-ce que c'est un choix du président Est-ce que, euh, pour le moins, les États euh, qui y sont partis Alors, ce comité s'est réuni une fois depuis l'adoption de la Convention. Il a été euh, convoqué à l'initiative du président Matsoni en 2012. Son mandat a été, pour la première réunion, en fait, de faire l'état des lieux. Euh, et euh, nous avions choisi de euh, réunir non seulement les États partis à la Convention, mais tous les États membres de l'UNESCO et de l'Unidroit. Au moins pour cette première euh, réunion, il fallait donner le plus de visibilité possible. Je m'arrêterai là. La conclusion est ce que nous allons faire maintenant. C'est d'abord, je crois qu'Unidroit doit se lancer dans un processus de renforcement de cet organe conventionnel. Il existe... Depuis Unidroit, dans ses conventions suivantes, des articles bien plus développés sur des comités d'évaluation. À l'époque, ce n'était pas le cas, mais justement la flexibilité, la souplesse de la disposition nous permet de faire beaucoup de choses. Donc réfléchissons tous ensemble à renforcer cet organe et à mettre en place ce « Legal Advisory Group » du projet académique qui va nous permettre de lancer des projets qui ont déjà commencé depuis 2017. Plusieurs conférences ont eu lieu et je crois qu'il est temps maintenant d'aller plus loin. Et je vous remercie. Monsieur. Merci beaucoup, Marina. Donc, um, so, uh, it, it falls on me to uh, be a bit more vulgar in this uh, uh, glamorous context, but uh, one of the things that we need, uh, apart from uh, support and participation, is financing and the, um, uh, the, the convention, the academic, uh, the 95 convention academic project could uh, indeed benefit from some help in terms of uh, seeking finance from for specific projects generally. So uh, any help that experts and friends of UNITRAC could provide us with that would be most, most appreciated. Uh, now, before we move on to the next uh, panel, we will um, give the floor for a statement to the representative of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Greece, Dr. Ms. Artemis Pavatanasiou. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished participants. Uh, I would like first to thank the UNIDRA and in particular Marina Schneider for their kind invitation to address this anniversary conference on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Greece. There are many things about the unique status of UNIDROA itself that should be mentioned in a conference of celebration. Its status as an intergovernmental organization whose fundamental objective is to prepare gradually for the adoption by various states of uniform rules of private law and in particular on issues of commercial law makes it really unique. Its independent status enables it to tackle more technical and less political issues while performing its core activities, including by analyzing possibilities to abolish differences and problems connected to private law and involving various national legislations. Last but not least, the UNIDROA has over the years prepared over 70 studies and drafts, many of which have resulted in international instruments of primary importance, including international conventions, modern laws, principles, legal and contractual guides. Since my country, Greece, has a specific and fully legitimate interest on the protection of cultural property, I would like here to praise the role of UNIDROA in this field by inter alia highlighting two of its essential contributions. The first is the contribution to the work of UNESCO. As an indication, I would like to recall the UNESCO UNIDRA model provisions on state ownership of undiscovered cultural objects, which constitute a joint response of the two organizations to a growing need for standardization of the definition of state ownership of cultural objects yet undiscovered, as well as a very important innovative tool to guide and assist the relevant national authorities and legislative bodies in establishing state ownership over property of unearthed archaeological objects. The second important contribution of UNIDROA in the same field is the conclusion of the 1997 conven 97 convention, whose anniversary we celebrate today and yesterday, of course. 
the illicit trafficking works of art, the international organized crime involved in cultural property, the tendency to launder money through the antiquities market, including the selling of stolen cultural objects in options or online options, are well known and persecuted all over the world. However, national laws on the matter differ widely, and this diversity is put to good use by traffickers, as for example, the limited territorial scope of the export bans set in place by individual states. The steps taken by one state to protect its works of art are not applied by other states, unless interstate agreements have been concluded to the contrary. Furthermore, the dramatic events of the recent past, such as the intentional targeting and destruction of cultural heritage in areas of armed conflict in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere, as well as the side consequences of this destruction, namely the looting of antiquities and their illicit trafficking and trade in the illegal market, including online sales, made even more clear why the protection of cultural property seems to be more timely than ever before. All the above developments make even more important the twofold approach of the Hinidra Convention on Illegally Exported Cultural Objects. Because, in the first place, this convention seeks to deal with the technical problems resulting from differences among national rules, and it is, in the second place, it is intended to contribute to the fight against the increase in illicit trafficking cultural objects and to show practically how the national relevant legislation may be adapted to. Greece is a country with a significant cultural heritage and as a consequence is extremely affected by the illicit import, export and transfer of ownership of its cultural property. In this context, my country highly appreciates the added value of the revolutionary, if I may use the term, principles established by the 1997 Five Hinidra Convention and does its utmost for raising awareness at the national level with regard to its proper implementation. If and if even uh, we could forget the rest of the enormous work of Hinidra, I think that the said two contributions alone would be enough to guarantee forever our appreciation to Hinidra. And this appreciation seems now to be transformed into an international recognition of Hinidua's many achievements, both legal and substantial, which have been reflected, and this is a major development, in the text of the most recent United Nations General Assembly Resolution on the Return and Restitution of Cultural Property to the Countries of Origin, which was adopted by the General Assembly in December 2018. I will conclude by quoting the two specific paragraphs on Hinidua in the text of the said United Nations General Assembly Resolution. Paragraph 6 of the resolution, 73-130, reaffirms the importance of the 1995 Hinidra Convention on stolen or illegally exported cultural objects, while paragraph 8 of the resolution acknowledges the launch of the 1995 Hinidra Convention academic project and the creation of the informal ratification task force as a platform for the exchange of views, information and assistance on issues such as the ratification and implementation of the Hinidra Convention on stolen or illegally exported cultural objects. I think that the said two paragraphs say it all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so the, um, we move on to the um, a brief uh, last panel before a number of statements and the debate takes place. Um, this last uh, panel um, is entitled towards an increased vigilance and strength in political will. And uh, obviously it's not going to verse upon um, substantive matters, but rather what needs to happen, how we can move forward with the convention. First speaker will be uh, Mr. Gilles, uh, Gilles de Keshoff, uh, who is the EU counterterrorism coordinator, who has uh, recorded a video for us. Trafficking in cultural goods has become one of the most profitable criminal activities alongside trafficking in drugs and in human beings. This has been acknowledged by various UN Security Council resolutions and most recently by the European Union when in July adopting the new security union strategy and should therefore be translated into further action and legislation at international level. Looting is organized in all regions of the world. In its 2019 report, Interpol indicates a 900% increase, increase 
in the number of criminal offenses related to work of arts and antiquities in Asia and a 200% increase in Africa. Daesh institutionalized the looting, either by excavating directly or by issuing excavation permits in Iraq and Syria, and was and probably remains involved in the illicit trade of objects. The symbolic dimension of the fight against this form of trafficking, which destroys people's identity, goes thus far beyond the economic value of recovery. Restitution can help countries to rebuild themselves. Long before Daesh, it was acknowledged that the legal framework of many states in the world is simply not sufficient to stem this flow. There are still too many loopholes for criminals to exploit. Time has come to get more effective investigation, prosecution and conviction. The looting has not diminished in times of COVID. It has increased. The destruction and trafficking of cultural heritage is, by definition, like in many areas of counterterrorism and organized crime that I cover, a cross-border crime. But there are huge legal valuations between countries. And without the involvement of international organization, it's simply impossible to develop an effective cooperation needed to protect our heritage, the shared heritage which belongs not just to one nation or society, but to all of us. The art market is one of the least regulated markets in the world, characterized by a lack of traceability and the speculative pricing of the object, two elements which create the perfect environment for money laundering, tax evasion and tax avoiding, and possibly terrorist financing. The European Union has started taking action with the adoption of the fifth uh, money laundering directive and the 2019 regulation on the introduction of um, uh, import uh, of cultural goods. The European Union has, at my request, set up at Europol uh, in 2018 a dedicated contact uh, point which led to already a sharp increase in the number of investigations. In a report published in July 2019, the European Commission noted that, and I quote, an essential element of this effort for all countries is the ratification and effective national implementation of the 1970 UNESCO Convention and the 1995 UNIDRA Convention. UNIDRA understands well the need for greater cooperation and harmonization between states and together with UNESCO has been at the forefront of this cause for decades. As many of you uh, know, the UNESCO's uh, uh, 1970 convention was groundbreaking in developing for the first time a legal framework for international cooperation to pro prohibit and prevent the illicit import, export and transfer of ownership of cultured property. UNESCO's political drive was key. In 1995, at UNESCO's request, UNIDRA produced its own convention, which added a vital new weapon to the world's legal arsenal against tr uh, cultural trafficking, providing a private law uh, framework for the restitution and return of illicit uh, works of art and antiquities. The Council of uh, Europe is active as well with the adoption of the Nicosia uh, Convention. Fifteen EU member states are parties to the UNIDRA Convention. Cyprus, Croatia, Denmark, Spain, Finland, Greece, Slovenia, Hungary, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Portugal, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Sweden and Norway. Not a member state, by the way. The dynamic in Europe is pretty positive and I'm very confident in the next steps and further progress for uh, the UNIDRA Convention. Another two uh, member states have signed, but not ratified yet, the UNIDRA Convention, France and the Netherlands. This is significant. Their signature means that they will not legislate against the principle of the Convention, though they are not formally bound by its provision. 
Finally, it should be noted that even government of, of states which are not yet party to the UNIDRA Convention are using some of its provisions. Switzerland, for instance, has implemented the 30 years uh, rule on limitation in its legislation. Belgium uses uh, some provision uh, on due diligence. By the way, the Belgian Senate has recommended, uh, rightly, I believe, the ratification of the UNIDRA uh, Convention in a 2018 report. UNIDRA can count on me and on my full support. One week, uh, one week ago, I uh, was meeting the Iraqi Minister of Foreign Affairs and I urged him to take all the necessary steps so that Iraq can become the 49th, if I'm not mistaken, member of UNIDRA. Uh, on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Convention, I'm uh, glad to be uh, one of the last speakers at your conference, which I hope was uh, very fruitful. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much uh, for this uh, very supportive and excellent presentation. I will preach by example and uh, be very brief on my part, so we're almost catching up on the uh, agreed initial agenda. Uh, my remarks um, will be very brief and they will be about um, the problems we encounter when we try to um, enhance the uh, number of countries that are part of the convention and what we do to um, um, improve the situation. Um, naturally, it was mentioned yesterday and it's something which could be predicated of all instruments. Uh, an international treaty is as good as, um, as the number of countries it has uh, as, as ratifying or acceding states. Um, 48 is a very decent number. But um, the, the convention would become absolutely instrumental uh, if the number grew. And that's where all our resources and, and, um, and efforts are being focused uh, now, and as has been the case for years. Uh, naturally, I uh, do not need to repeat that our forefront um, uh, officer and, and leader of the project, uh, Barina Schneider, goes around the world preaching uh, precisely these aims, and uh, she's our uh, main weapon, uh, since weapons were the, um, uh, that was the, term, the, the war terminology used by my predecessor in the world, I think is correct. Um, um, so um, in terms of institutional action, uh, we uh, have uh, recently been involved in a number of initiatives which, which we believe are very useful. Um, we are part, of course, of the UNIDRA Convention Ratification Task Force, which was set up in 2017 um, in New York uh, and which meets biannually. Um, we are also um, in a direct relationship with the um, a group of friends of uh, um, protection, the protection of cultural property which was founded a year after in New York also by the initiative of the Italian ministry and the um, ministry of Cyprus to the UN, the representations of the, uh, sorry, of both states to the UN, uh, which is, uh, and we hope will become still even more active in the matter because it has the, the ability to canvas support in a place where it is most needed. Um, we participate in many uh, important events we did in the G7 for culture and um, perhaps uh, it is worth, I will not make a full list, but it's worth mentioning, of course, the continuous support of the General Assembly of the United Nations with declarations uh, which have taken place even in the UN Security Council. So the institutional support from, from the side of the UN is, is complete and our partnering with UNESCO is known to all of you and extremely important. Um, other IGOs as well are collaborating with us. So um, to make it brief, because you know most of these things already, um, when we go to countries, we encounter a number of, um, I wouldn't say oppositions, but questions which deter countries or at least slow the process of, uh, of accession to the treaty. I will not go into uh, all of those because many of them have already been um, um, discussed in, in these two days. Uh, but I would like to make some, make some specific references. First of all, 
allow me to focus on the importance of the book that should come out of this uh, um, celebration, because it is supposed to provide a, a, a thorough, detailed legal analysis of, of these matters, of these questions that are actually uh, concerns of governments before they decide to join. So this is not just going to be another book of a conference, an acts of a conference, but rather it, it, it's purport, it purports to be extremely, uh, an extremely useful tool for us to go to countries and, and to say, well, you, you know, the questions are these, these are the answers, and of course we'll be delighted to enhance and to elaborate, but uh, um, the, the provision of this um, thorough independent legal analysis, we believe, can be key and a great tribute to the 25th anniversary. So when we go to countries to try to convince governments to uh, approve the convention, we could perhaps simplify and a bit separate between two types of countries, those that have the cultural property which is stolen or Ill Ill illegally trafficked, and those which are actually where the markets are. Uh, and uh, naturally, the concerns in both types of countries are very different. Uh, when you go to a country which has uh, um, ancient cultural heritage, but is a, a country uh, which is commonly looted. Um, their concern uh, comes from a very natural uh, reaction of all human beings, which is we are on the right side of this deal. We are stolen. Our property is being stolen and sold in richer countries on uh, more developed markets. So when we get and we require to get a devolution or restitution, why would we need to uh, uh, compensate anyone? This is the natural instinctive. If you've been robbed, why should I compensate anyone? Why should compensation be in order? Uh, of course, this is a very uh, complex matter. The answer to that evidently is, well, the compensation, there are other legal interests at play. Uh, the compensation only plays uh, in cases of good faith. Um, the convention introduces the due diligence requirement, which is something which is not necessarily present in many local uh, domestic legislations. Uh, and this compensation already exists in the uh, 1970 uh, convention. So this is actually an improvement for what, it, what, what we have. This is something which uh, will um, provide further certainty to the country and further protection because compensation will be fair and equitable and it will only be uh, in order whenever a due diligence has been properly conducted. So it's a very nuanced position that the convention has, aims to strike a balance which is important and therefore improves uh, the pre-existing uh, domestic and international framework. And it also um, um, strikes a balance between all the parties involved. So sometimes all too often uh, the um, Perfect is the, is the worst enemy of the good. And I'm afraid in international relations, often the good is all we can aim for. So um, this is something which uh, should be borne in mind. Um, as to the countries where big markets are and, and the dealers are, um, uh, well, I would not uh, um, sermon anyone about uh, the uh, justice, uh, um, argument, which is the one that lies under the, uh, the convention, really, uh, because that is self-evident to the governments of all those countries, as it's, uh, uh, it is very difficult not to find a country which hasn't ratified the convention, which is uh, a country of the market, uh, which doesn't proclaim the same principles that the convention defends, uh, but then action is not taken. Uh, and um, um, it, Pure consistency would be very helpful. If you say one thing, you should perhaps create a legal environment that allows for that actually to be implemented in reality. Uh, the fact that local legislation mirrors some of the um, um, substantive provisions of the convention is better than nothing indeed, but it's not as good as having the convention because it still creates a strong local domestic element, therefore generates legal uncertainty uh, and is less secure and is less efficient because what the convention is, is very efficient in terms of restitution and especially devolution. So uh, the arguments are non-convincing unless 
a government is just trying to protect parochial interests, which is not uh, at least uh, something they would admit to be defending in reality themselves. So uh, the, the, the convention, some have criticized it, I think wisely perhaps provides for non-retroactivity, which means governments are given a fresh start. You can do it, you know, whatever happened before, fine, but from now on, let's just change the, the way we approach this problem. So what seems to be a, perhaps a weakness is actually a strength, a strength of the convention or can be turned into that. Um, as we say in Spanish, uh, to make virtue out of necessity. So um, um, that, that would be it uh, from my side. Uh, and um, we will continue to work towards uh, an enhanced political will. And again, we count on all of you as experts that you are in your own respective countries. Now it is the time for uh, a number of declaration from states. Uh, first, uh, Monsieur Lemon Rabot, l'honorable ministre de la Culture de la Mauritanie, a la parole. Madame la Présidente, Monsieur le Secrétaire général de l'Institut international et du droit, Monsieur les représentants des États, Mesdames et Messieurs les participants, permettez-moi tout d'abord d'exprimer mes chaleureuses félicitations pour l'Institut international en droit et son équipe pour le travail accompli au cours de ces 25 ans d'existence. Madame, Monsieur, les pouvoirs publics en Mauritanie ont pris des mesures concrètes en direction de la lutte contre le vol et le trafic illicite des biens culturels. C'est dans ce cadre et en étroite collaboration avec l'UNESCO que je salue ici pour son engagement et sa détermination que nous avons <coughs> mené d'importantes actions qui sont la révision de notre arsenal juridique relatif à la protection du patrimoine culturel en y insérant des textes exclusivement consacrés à la lutte contre le vol et le trafic illicite des biens culturels. L'organisation de, de formations ciblant les magistrats, les services de gendarmerie, de la douane et des forces de sécurité ainsi que le personnel du département de la culture et les acteurs de la société civile. L'organisation d'une campagne de sensibilisation dont les acteurs principaux sont les leaders d'opinion et en particulier les femmes qui ont un rôle central dans la protection du patrimoine culturel. La relance du processus d'adhésion de notre pays à la Convention unie droit de 1995 sur les biens volés ou illicitement exportés et la Convention de la Haye de 1954 sur la protection des biens culturels en cas de conflit armé et au second protocole de 1999 relatif à cette dernière et aussi la Convention 2001 relative à la protection du patrimoine subaquatique. Notre pays s'active à jeter les bases d'une véritable stratégie de sauvegarde et de valorisation de toutes les composantes de notre patrimoine culturel national en étroite concertation avec les collectivités locales et la société civile dans le cadre du plan de développement du patrimoine culturel adopté récemment par le gouvernement mauritanien et ce conformément à l'impulsion que constitue le volet culturel du programme du président de la République, M. Je vous souhaite plein succès et je vous remercie. Now we will hear a statement. Um, by representative of the National Cultural Heritage Administration of China, Ms. Xi Zhu, direct, Deputy Director of International Organizations. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. On behalf of National Cultural Heritage Administration of China, it's my great pleasure to take this opportunity to congratulate the 1995 Convention on its 25th anniversary and share some experience of China on the aspect of return and restitution of cultural objects. For 25 years, UNIDOA has made tremendous efforts to respond to challenges in implementing the convention and enhance its e effectiveness, such as adopting the model legislative provisions on state ownership of undiscovered cultural objects, 
launching the academic project UCAP and organizing special meetings. The Chinese government highly appreciates and warmly congratulates on the significant progress the UNITWA has made. Since the ratification of 1970 Convention and 1995 Convention, China has, take, has taken a number of measures in preventing theft and illicit export of cultural property and facilitating return of lost cultural objects to their countries of origin. Initial achievements have been scored as follows. First, to carry out international cooperation under the framework of international conventions. So far, China has concluded bilateral agreements or MOUs with 23 countries in regard of preventing theft, clandestine excavation and illicit import and export of cultural property, including Italy, Greece, USA, Switzerland, and etc. China has led prepar preparation of the Dunhuang Declaration, calling for return of historically lost cultural objects back to their countries of origin. Second, to carry out transdepartmental cooperation for the purpose of combating crimes against cultural property, National Cultural Heritage Administration and Ministry of Public Security have co-launched continued campaigns to fight against crimes involving cultural property since 2017, 3,481 crimes involving cultural property have been detected, with 5,867 suspects seized. 751 criminal gangs cracked down and over 40,000 cultural objects recovered. Ministry of, Ministry of Public Security has successfully issued five lists of wanted circulars listing 52 major suspects at large of whom 70, uh, 49 have been arrested. The ramped trend of crimes against cultural property have been brought under effective control. Third, to develop effective channels for the restriction and return of lost cultural objects through diplomatic negotiation, enforcement cooperation, and civil action. Eight groups of stolen cultural objects, totaling 240 sets have been repatriated from USA, France, Denmark, and Japan. Five groups of illic uh, illicitly exported and cultural objects totaling 4,603 sets have been repatriated from UK, Italy, and USA. Fourth, to strengthen information development and raise public awareness, in 2017 and 2018, China has respectively launched the information platform for stolen and lost Chinese cultural objects and the database on stolen foreign cultural objects, updating them periodically to provide information support for international fight against theft and looting of cultural property. In 2018, 19, three exhibitions on the theme of returned cultural objects have been presented, attracting up to 1 million visitors and more than 2 billion online viewers of new coverage. China is a country with abandoned cultural heritage, as well as a country suffered from loss of cultural objects in history and in modern times. The 1995 Convention provides important legal basis and international ethic support for countries who have their cultural objects lost abro ab abroad with regard, uh, with regard to return of stolen or illegally exported cultural objects back to their countries of origin. China pays great attention to the follow-up development of the Convention and is willing to provide information, human resources, and technical support in this regard. China would like to work with UNIDUA and all the member states to facilitate the effectiveness of the convention in a wider area and promote joint research and bilateral cooperation to enhance actual effect of the convention in the international community of cultural heritage conservation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we will hear a statement by His Excellency Mr. Serendorf uh, Jambaldor, Ambassador of uh, Mongolia in Italy. Thank you very much, Secretary General, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of the government of Mongolia, I would like to 
congratulate the Secretariat of the UNIDRAW on the 25th anniversary of the UNIDRAW Convention on Stolen and Illegally Exported Cultural Objects. Mongolia appreciates the effectiveness and significance of the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. And the 1995 UNIDRA Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects. These conventions are crucial international mechanism to preventing the loss of cultural values and heritage for all countries. I would like to highlight that since the moment Mongolia has acceded to the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property in 1991, it has been making efforts to consolidate a collaborative mechanism among law enforcement organizations in the framework of promoting the principles of the convention, integrating into national laws and implementing the convention nationwide. Further, we put a great importance and effort in improving the relations with our other countries and international partners in the field of the implementation. For instance, with the support of the UNESCO Monaco Funds and Trust Corporation, a series of training sessions aimed to strengthen the capacity of yielding of human resources in law enforcement organizations were conducted in Mongolia between 2009 and 2014 to support the capacity building for combating the illicit trafficking of cultural property project. A team of representatives of different public organizations were also visited Italy and France to obtain the better knowledge and experience in combating crimes against cultural property. I would like to note and thank the Secretariat of the UNIDRAW, especially Ms. Schneider, providing their full support to the implementation of this important project. Currently, we are reviewing the accession of Mongolia to the 1995 UNIDRAW Convention to bring further efforts in combating the illicit trafficking of cultural property to prevent illicit importing and the transfer of ownership rights in more efficient ways and to bring the international cooperation to the new heights. Further, we plan to present the review to the Parliament of Mongolia in the near future. We hope other countries, especially developed countries, we join their convention's mission to establish a common global order to combat and prevent the illicit trade and cultural property and make full efforts to protect the legitimate interests of all peoples. I wish you all success in your future endeavors to combat the crimes and conflicts against cultural property. Finally, once again, I would like to congratulate you on the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the UNIDRA Convention. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, the uh, uh, one final statement from uh, Mr. Jasham Husainli, rep representative of the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Azerbaijan. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary uh, General, Excellencies, dear colleagues, friends. It's a great privilege to congratulate all of you with the 25th anniversary of the 1995 Hindra Convention on stolen or illegally exported cultural objects. 
In this regard, let me convey the best wishes on behalf of the Minister of Culture of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Happy anniversary. The prevention of illicit trade of stolen cultural values has obtained a great importance in a globalizing world. Hence, the international legal documents on this matter of various organizations are not accidental, among which, us, uh, among which are the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, the 1970 UNESCO Convention of the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing of uh, the Illicit Import, Export and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property, European Union and Council of Europe relevant law instruments, and so on. However, in this role, the 1995 Unidra Convention plays a unique role and has an uh, indeplaceable influence. Unlike the listed conventions, which operate mainly in the field of, the, of public international law, the Unidra Convention covers the rather complex area of private international law. The reason is simple. UNESCO conventions practically block the opportunities for the official traffic of stolen cultural property. Nevertheless, unofficially, the stolen cultural values settle in private collections that are very difficult to control. It is no secret that illegal traffic affects largely cultural values stolen from the occupied territories in the zone of military conflicts. In this context, there is no doubt that the 1995 UNIDRA Convention must be strengthened and continue to prevent this illegal leakage. There is a need to increase the transparency of cultural goods origin in private collections, auctions, art markets, etc. to make it extremely unprofitable for them to deal with counterfeit material. On the contrary, to take some encouraging measures on the part of states interested in restoring justice. Development may be different, but first, we should develop mechanisms to implement the convention. It might make sense to design something like the operational guidelines of the convention. In this regard, we are ready for active cooperation in the further development of the UNIDRA convention on stolen, stolen or illegally exported cultural objects. As an example of the catastrophe in this sphere, we can cite what happens in 20% of the Republic of Azerbaijan's occupied territories due to aggression by the Republic of Armenia's armed forces, along with a humanitarian disaster, ethnic cleansing, a million refugees, and a destroyed industrial and agricultural infrastructure, we have thousands of destroyed cultural institutions such as museums, galleries, palaces, libraries, temples, historical monuments. Occupying forces plundered hundreds of thousands of cultural objects and museum values belonging to Azerbaijani culture. All this was illegally exported and sold, including to private collections in various countries, unfortunately. Such facts of illegal export of stolen cultural objects happen in all countries where territories have been occupied because of military aggression. We must stop it and return the stolen cultural property with real owners. The 1995 UNIDRA Convention on Stolen and or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects can play an invaluable role in, in the identifying stolen cultural objects which for one reason or another ended up in private collections, art markets, and auctions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we come to the um, moment of debate. We have some time for discussion, not too much, but uh, a bit. Um, we do have questions, I believe. Uh, is there anyone from, who would like to ask any question here from the floor here in Rome? Anyone? Otherwise, we'll, uh, we encourage participants to send questions. Okay, well then, that's until uh, and unless any of you asks any questions. We have a question 
which I hesitated to ask first because it concerns yesterday, but I would believe that the, the question is actually posed to the experts in the room. Um, can speakers talk to the suggestion of Professor Kono in yesterday's keynote address to broaden unit rights to cultural heritage from cultural property as originally suggested by Professor Brott? And perhaps some opinion also on the change of uh, paradigm, paradigm for um, uh, the applicable law between the lex res situs and the, uh, the rule applicable to inheritance law. Is there anyone here who would like to take a shot at answering that? Okay, thank you. No, I don't have much to say in the sense that there, there should be a lot of things to be said about this. Uh, I personally, like some of our colleagues here, I wrote a few pages on the uh, hack course I gave him a few years ago because this is a very, very technical issue. Uh, both are technical issues in the sense that one, the first problem is the choice of the term cultural property or cultural heritage. Um, it's real, what I called in an old article, a battle of concepts, uh, as it was very well uh, explained yesterday by our friend Carno and, of, and sure by, by Lyndall Prout some years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm not a native English speaking, as you can understand, so I'm not the best placed person to, to, to explain why the choice could be to, to property or, or heritage, but certainly we're dealing with two different concepts, as was very well explained. And the second issue is, uh, would it be better to abandon the, the, the classical criterion of Lex Ray seat of the, the no other place where the uh, item is located in order to, to make a better choice with the Lex Originis, so-called. Well, this is uh, another classical uh, issue because uh, in, in general, uh, one would be tempted to say yes, but we cannot forget that there are cases where a choice of the Lex Originis is practically impossible and there are many examples that may be taken from the past in the sense that the, the actual states uh, do not exactly coincide with the ancient uh, civilizations. So, so in some cases, uh, um, it would be difficult to, um, to establish whether the uh, successor state would be that one or, or another one. But we can take examples also in case of uh, modern or contemporary art, uh, let's think about a very famous artist like uh, Amedeo Modigliani. Is he an expression of the Italian culture rather than the French culture, considering that he was a native Italian, but he was a French citizen. He died in Paris, he lived and worked in Paris. So who, which state would be entitled to be considered the uh, state of the lex of origin of the artist. So you see, it's not that easy. So in principle, I agree, but I wrote some pages to explain that it's not always the case to make this choice. So probably it's better to uh, rely on the old principle of the law of the place where the item is located. Thank you very much. That was actually clearly that reflection becomes even more complicated if we talk about Picasso, for example a Spaniard in France all, most of his life. A Spaniard, however, who believed to be uh, you know, a Spanish nationalist in a way. So how would you factor that in when it comes to describing it's a Spanish or French art? Um, so um, I believe uh, Dr. Artemis uh, Papatanasiu uh, would like to also take a shot at answering this question. Uh, um, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Tirado. Uh, my, um, I'm wondering whether I can uh, um, share some views uh, on the question on uh, uh, whether to use the term uh, origin or property, uh, the term heritage or property. And my reaction is, yes, my reaction is that uh, uh, the term heritage is a very wide term, much wider than uh, the term property, because heritage means a lot of things. It's both tangible and intangible heritage. 
But when we speak about the illicit trafficking in cultural property, uh, we cannot speak about intangible heritage as far as illicit trafficking is concerned. So I think that the best, uh, the, the, the use of the word, uh, of the term property in the UNITRA Convention is, uh, the, um, uh, is very wise, as is the case also for uh, the 1970 Convention. Other conventions, um, namely UNESCO conventions, uh, which um, uh, would like to, um, to protect uh, heritage, specific parts of heritage, such, such as the intangible cultural heritage, as is the 2003 UNESCO Convention, use the term heritage. The heritage is much wider and includes both tangible uh, cultural property and intangible too. So uh, when we are speaking about illicit trafficking in cultural property, I think that we are speaking about uh, illicit trafficking in property, which is tangible. So this is my contribution. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Vignon, I think you wanted to contribute. Yes, um, I totally agree with the, the speakers. And uh, what I want to add as well is that uh, the, the conventions, the 1970 convention, and in particular, and the 1995 convention focus on the cultural property aspect. But when we talk about the development of international cultural heritage law today, so we use the term cultural heritage because that englobes the tangible and the tangible has been has, has been just said and I suppose when we talk about international cultural law, cultural heritage law as an independent and developing set of law which has its own principles and its own um, uh, in, uh, framework so this distinction exists but it will be impossible to change the the wording of the title of the international conventions that already exist and have already been ratified it is not advisable and it's not practical Thanks for that uh comment. Uh, Professor Renault? If I may simply uh, say the UNIRWA Convention has in fact um, found a midterm between these two issues because it relates to cultural objects. So we're not talking either of property or of, of heritage. So that's uh, one important uh, element we should maybe not forget. If I may ask a question, if uh, the chairman allows me. Uh, I would uh, like to address a question to uh, Professor Malaguti um, regarding the question of um, immunity. Um, you mentioned immunity from criminal proceedings. I personally have doubts that um, immunity can also uh, relate to criminal uh, proceedings relating to cultural property, as you, I think, of, of, what, of what you mentioned. Um, however, I'd be interested to know if in the debate on this matter, you have found a strong position in favor of a broad interpretation, including um, criminal um, uh, proceedings relating to cultural heritage. For example, in Switzerland, um, the, the, the statute is not clear on this, and there's a very strong debate as to whether there can be or not immunity in that uh, respect. Um, I would be very interested to know your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you. In, no, I, I tend to agree with you in terms of uh, uh, logics uh, of the of the legal instruments. It is uh, the debate was coming, in fact, in Italy, not from scholar. It was not a scholarly debate. It was coming from the Justice Commission, and uh, I think the real point is uh, what is defined as a criminal attempt, which might be different according to the legal system, is the sense that you might have some measures uh, that are considered to be of a criminal nature, which with only with sanctions, with no risk of imprisonment, of course. And so this might be a borderline between what is civil and what is criminal. So I think that what, at least what, in my understanding, what the Justice Commission was trying to say was that uh, you have to balance constitutional rights and be sure that if there is a constitutional right to be protected, 
you need to have another one on the other side to be able to be able to overcome that that principle so the comment in fact of the justice commission in that case was uh, uh, we would accept that you derogate from general principles of criminal law in general only if you can prove that what you are protecting is protected by constitution, which was uh, not fully clear. And the kind of debate that we are, we are having, it is clear. I mean, property right uh, is not... It, it's not, I mean, property right as such on an, on an asset might not be protected as we would expect because we consider it to be cultu cultural, I'd say, in, in, in the sense. But that was not a debate I saw by scholars. I don't know whether I'm missing some, but it was really only a point that was raised by, by the Justice Commission. But it was enough to refuse to give positive, uh, positive clearance to the, to the proposal. Thank you. Um, I, I would have a question personally, if there is no other that I can see now, um, to um, Professor uh, Wang Yungxia uh, about her intervention on the application. Um, um, being China part of the convention, uh, you've quoted a number of norms which would contradict the convention. Uh, um, would that be possible because, uh, or would depart from the convention, would that be possible because they are in uh, norms which are supposed to be hierarchically superior to an international convention, or would that be because um, they, in China, conventions are hierarchically deemed to be equal to laws, and therefore if it's after it derogues the uh, previous law? So it's a matter of hierarchical, of hierarchy of norms? Thank you for your question, but I'm not sure if I can catch your meaning clearly. Um, did you mean that uh, if the convention could uh, applicable in China directly or? No, yes. Okay. So, so China as, as part of the convention uh, is bound to apply the convention like all countries that are part to it. Um, and um, you mentioned an, a, a number of items where the Chinese legal framework departs from the convention in its solutions. And um, I was wondering whether that would be because um, they are, for example, in some countries, um, a, a norm which is in the civil code, the civil code is deemed to be hierarchically superior to other norms and therefore yes. it derogues the contradiction. Uh, in other countries, the solution would be different, would be one of uh, international conventions are deemed to be just laws internally, and therefore they can be derogated by okay. uh, laws which are approved later. Uh, what would I be see. the situation in China? If that, because I, there I seem see. to be many exceptions. Okay. Uh, the civil law is very, civil code is very, very important law in China. But actually, it's only one of the basic law. Uh, if this issue involved, involved in a special issue, for example, cultural objects, it should uh, connect it with the cultural relics protection law. So if there are any special provi prov uh, provisions uh, other than the I mean, uh, it's different with the general provisions uh, stipulated in co uh, the civil code. And the court, the, 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 uh, the, the court will, uh, according, will apply the, uh, the, the, the cultural relics protection law. But unfortunately, the special law doesn't concern about the civil issues. So there is a huge loop, a huge gap between the uh, special law and the general uh, civil code. That's the big problem in China. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's move to the um, closing session. Um,
The first person to take the floor is going to be the Vice Minister of Culture of Lithuania, Ms. Ingrida Veliute, and uh, she has this honor because Lithuania was the first country to ratify the convention and is therefore very much in our hearts. Vice Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, distinguished speakers of the conference, the Professor Terado and the UNIDROT Secretary, the ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me to give the closing speech for this important conference marking the 25th anniversary of the UNIDROT Convention and uh, unstolen or illegally exported cultural objects. As mentioned a lot of times, it is nonetheless important that we also mark the 15th anniversary of the another important international instrument against the illicit trafficking of cultural property, the 1970 UNESCO Convention this year. On this particular occasion, I would have a pleasure to share with you a Lithuanian success story demonstrating the importance of legal international instruments. Uh, two months ago, we had a milestone event in Lithuanian cultural history after 10 years of legal struggles and negotiations, the unique late Gothic uh, wooden sculpture from 16th century, the risen Christ was returned to Lithuania from Austria. The sculpture as a part of collection which belonged to a priest Richard Nikutavichus and recognized as a movable cultural property by national authorities was smuggled out of Lithuania in 2000-2001. After the murder of the priest that was connected with his rich collection, the fate of the sculpture became unclear. Almost 10 years backward, the Risen Heights sculpture was noticed in an antique store in Vienna, Austria. An examination of the identification confirmed the authenticity of the religious uh, sculpture illegally smuggled out from Lithuania and since then sought after. Also to be noted that the artwork traveled across Europe and arrived to Vienna from an auction house in Copenhagen, Denmark. The whole process was long and complicated. Lithuania had to bring a claim before the Austrian court and to prove the authenticity of the right of ownership of the illegally exported sculpture in accordance with the uh, European Council Directive of 15 March of 1993 on the return of cultural objects unlawfully removed from the territory of a member state, the state which uh, was in force at the time. After a favorable decision of the court, we had to continue legal proceedings as the new owner of the Risen Christ, who bought it in auction in Copenhagen, had restored the sculpture by uh, recreating its fingers and feet. So we still had to solve the matter of restoration expenses and also the right of ownership. And finally, this year, Vienna court decided that the Risen Christ should be returned to Lithuania. The latest owner of the sculpture was awarded a compensation covering the expenses he had incurred. I must mention that the return of the Risen Christ could not happen without the joint efforts of all. Many Lithuanian culture institutions and diplomats got involved into this process. In particular, we are grateful to the Lithuanian Embassy in Vienna and Mr. Ulrich Salzburg, the Lithuanian Honorary Consul in Austria. In closing, I want to stress the importance of the international legal instruments in recovering lost cultural property and objects. Unidroid Convention on Stolen or Illegal Exported Cultural Objects of 1995, 1970 UNESCO Convention and European Directives and Regulations are crucial instruments for those willing to restore the right of ownership of stolen or illegally removed national culture properties and objects. On the basis of our experience, I do strongly encourage the other countries to ratify the UNIDROT Convention of 1995 to strengthen the protection of movable culture objects. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon in Rome. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, the next closing remark is going to be given by a uh, representative of our host state, Italy, uh, Mr. Giorgio Marapodi. As Director General of Development and Cooperation, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy, Signore Marapodi, la parola è sua. Mr. Secretary General, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be, a, to be, to be with, you, with you today. I've been representing my country for, for a 
so for many years in the in in Unidra, and I have uh, have beautiful memories. So thanks, uh, thanks again for involving me in this uh, 1995 Unidra convention uh, um, session session of work. Um, I also uh, would like allow me also to uh, congratulate the new president of Unidra, uh, Professor Maria Chiara Malaguti, uh, on uh, her recent appointment. Appointment. Um, it is a, it is for me a pleasure to inter to intervene in this closing session uh, to mark the uh, that is a, which is marking the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Unidra Convention on Stolen or illegally exported cultural objects. It is, uh, as I said, it is an honor, it is a pleasure indeed to join you today after three sessions of rich debate on achievements and challenges on the protection of cultural heritage. An honor, an honor and a pleasure three times, allow me to, to say, first, as a representative of Italy, the party that uh, promoted and supported the 1995 convention by hosting the conference and the signing and then the role of the posterity. Second, as a former head uh, of the legal service of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs between 2010 and 2013, when I had the opportunity to better understand the UNIDRA importance, appreciate its work and strengthen our legal collaboration. Third, as current Director General for Development Cooperation of the Ministry, dealing with the protection of cultural heritage as a priority field of action in supporting the sustainable development of partner countries. As we enter into the decade of action to implement the 2030 Agenda, Italy is uh, committed to continue to support sustainable development pathways which integrate and harness the cultural dimensions and are founded on the rule of law. Even more, cultural heritage and rule of law are enablers of sustainable development. And in this regard, the work of UNIDRA has been particularly valuable. By addressing the issue of the restitution of stolen or illegally exported cultural property and of the balance between protecting cultural heritage and maintaining a fair place for lawful trade, not only as the 1995 Convention overcome one of the shortcomings of international law, to use the words of former President of the Italian Republic, Oscar Luigi Scalfaro, at his audience to the delegation to the conference in 1995, but it has also helped enhance the international cooperation on, cultural, on culture and development. For instance, the principles of the Convention are taken into account in the clauses on the cooperation to combat the illegal trafficking of artworks included in the executive programs of cultural agreements signed by Italy with other states, not parties. The value added of the UNIDRA activities is not limited to the, to the 1995 convention we celebrate today. The UNESCO UNIDRA model provisions assist countries in adopting effective legislation for the establishment and the recognition of the state's ownership of undiscovered cultural object. In addition, by increasing the awareness and knowledge about the 1995 Convention, the model provisions and other related international instruments, the academic project UCAP promotes a favorable legal environment for restitution and return of stolen or illegally exported cultural objects. In a wider perspective, I would like to spend a few more words on the Italian commitment to support partner countries in protecting their cultural heritage and making it an engine of sustainable development. According to our development, development cooperation strategy, not only cultural heritage is a resource for economic and social development, but also a tool to eradicate poverty and mitigate ethnic, religious, and social tensions. In brief, cultural heritage is both a factor for development and for peace and stability. The Italian cooperation approach 
is centered on the social dimension of the heritage, on a development model in which local communities play an active role and cultural resources are common goods. In this framework, we are engaged in the following activities, training, capacity building and transfer of competencies, technologies and innovation, safeguarding of or recovering and enhancing historic and archeological sites, supporting arts and museum, cultural and creative industries and sustainable tourism, fostering the policy coherence, a multi-dimensional action that which is also multi-stakeholder through the involvement of such actors represent, represented today as the Carabinieri Command for the Protection of Cultural Heritage, the Ministry of Cultural Heritage and Tourism, University, international organization, and so on. In the last 10 years, we have launched over 30 initiatives in the field of protecting and enhancing cultural heritage in partner countries in Africa, Middle East, Latin America, and Caribbean, Asia, and Europe. In Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Cuba, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Sudan, just to mention a few examples, we have worked on developing local capacities and making cultural heritage sites, museums, an opportunity for economic growth, social inclusion, sustainable business and decent employment, in particular, in particular for the most vulnerable. Many projects have been implemented by UNESCO or together with UNESCO, consistently with the Italian commitment to support multilateralism and specialized agency in the cultural sector as well. And other international organisms we engage with on safe safeguarding cult cultural heritage is the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and the Restoration of Cultural Property, ICROM, also attending today, with which the Italian Development Cooperation has strengthened collaboration over the last few years, notably on such initiatives as the Africa Program and the meeting with African universities in the context of the International Forum of Gran Sasso in Teramo. Ladies and gentlemen, as we have all learned from the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis, accessing and enjoying cultural heritage is part and parcel of our life, of the better life everybody aspires to, while endeavoring to plan strategies for recovering better, we should reserve to cultural heritage a place at the heart of our action to build back better, because without culture, there is no truly sustainable, just and resilient future. With this vision in mind, I'm confident that UNIDRA will continue to play a key role in this regard by addressing <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, the remaining and emerging legal challenges of the fight against <coughs> illicit trafficking of cultural heritage. Thank you very much, and my best wishes to you all. Grazie, Ambassadore Marpoli. Uh, so it, it remains for me to conclude, but before I do that, I'd like to improvise one last um, intervention by uh, I'd like to hear the final. Uh, summary and reflections from uh, Marina Schneider. <laughs> I knew she would love it. <laughs> this is because I'm a weapon. <laughs> so we not forget. Uh, well, thank you for, for giving me the floor, which really is, I was not expecting. Um, I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased and most of this I'm very grateful. Very grateful to um, you who came to Rome, who had the possibility to come to Rome. Um, we've been working together for many, many years and we will. Um, I'm very happy also of all the people who followed us um, from far. I think we have um, a lot of things on the table. Uh, it's uh, 25 years is certainly a, an important moment, um, but a lot has to be done 
and uh, to work together. I think we, in my presentation before, I said that we need you, we need all of you, we need to feed the discussion because uh, UNIDRA is uh, not a big organization. We do not have uh, organs to follow regularly things. So uh, we do our best, we will go on, but um, thank you and looking forward to continuing working with all of you. Thank you, Marina. 25 years of the convention and 25 years of her life devoted to it. I think she deserves. Uh... Well, it remains very little for me to say after this, just that um, I also echo her words of appreciation to all of you and to the many that have been joining as panelists or as uh, public um, these two days. Um, yesterday, we peaked at uh, a bit over 300, I believe, and, and today we were nearing 200. That's a lot of attendance uh, um, for uh, in such difficult conditions uh, as these that we are living these days. Uh, um, one of the things that institutionally we um, will go home with uh, as, as an asset is the strong support for the convention, the existence of a strong network of experts and people who, who are willing to uh, uh, bring this on for, 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 for as long as it takes, um, and the international co conviction that this is something which is worth uh, pursuing further. Uh, Again, I'd like to show our appreciation to the uh, minister and the ambassadors that have been participating and all the government representatives that have taken place in this debate over the, these um, two years. From our side, I can only guarantee that we will continue um, through Marina, of course, but also institutionally um, to uh, try to take our convention even further uh, to the benefit of the world. And if I may say of justice as well. Uh, so uh, thank you, merci beaucoup, and uh, I hope to see you uh, in another 25 years, me from the other side. Thank you. <clears throat>